departments. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, initiate decisions. Uh, these are these are these are great ways to think of a director. Give me a couple more. There's there's still more uh, to talk about. One or two others. What does a director do? Yeah, uh, Kevin William. Uh, I think director is a creator, storyteller, cool. designer. Yeah. And yeah. maybe we can use a gut phrase. <laughs> how do you yeah. how do you mean that last one? I like that. How do you uh, mean that last? One? Yeah, director is like creating his own universe, his own world. Yeah. And I think uh, the crew was the the angel. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good metaphor. Yeah. That's good. Okay. That's so it. we've got. It's great. It's great. We've got creator. Uh, we've got this this God idea. Let's not it, uh, let it go to our heads. But uh, but I think this is a this is a good a good metaphor here. Uh, and and you know uh, you just said the crew is like angels. And I, I, well, I think it's a, a great answer. I think in a lot of ways it's true. Uh, many crew members that I've worked with, my my cinematographer or my director of photography, for example, we can talk about these people. They have saved me before, and uh, I think that's what, what angels do sometimes. So, so it can be true in a lot of ways. Anyone else? One more, one more idea of what a director does. There's a big one, like a really big one floating out there that no one has said yet. And for me, it's one of like the two, maybe three most important things that a director does. Come on, guy. Uh, hello? Uh, I see, uh, yeah, Alexander. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a director uh, is like a pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. He supervises everything, uh, especially in actors, camera, and good. other things that in filmmaking process. Good, good. And you, you touched on the one that I was searching for, which we'll go into a little more today, which is working with actors, uh, which I think is such a primary responsibility of the director. I like how so far we have these different metaphors. We have the director as God, we have the director as a pilot. I think the director is always high up in the air. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, but these are, uh, these are good, these are good. So, so let's, let's put some of these together and then we'll talk in more detail. The director is a creator. Uh, I'll use some of your words. The director is a designer, these are good. The director communicates. And I don't know if that specific word was used, but several of you said that in other ways. And for me, this is one of the single most important words for a director. We have to get uh, what's in here uh, out onto the screen. And in order to do that, I need to have the language, the grammar, uh, the courage, um, and the artistry to be able to communicate those ideas with a whole lot of different people. It's a huge challenge of being a director. It can be really intimidating and it can be really, really fun. Some of those people that we work with, you guys have already mentioned. The director works with the actors. The director works with the actors to find what type of performance suits the film. The director works with the actors to motivate their performance. Why am I doing this? Why am I walking into this room right now? What am I doing here? The director's job is to be there for the actors. It's a, it's a collaboration. Also, in my opinion, a really important word. While we can use this God metaphor, and I know it was, um, it's a good one, I think it's also important to remember that filmmaking is a team idea. And without this team, no good films happen. And so working with actors to motivate their performance, to keep them in the right frame of mind, to uh, simply be there for them if they're unsure about what they're doing. No actors uh, knowing that someone is there for them, encouraging them, is a big help. Working with your director of photography, your cinematographer, um, your cinematographer very overly simply is your person uh, who is going to be on set uh, working with you in terms of lighting the scene, in terms of camera movement, in terms of deciding what lenses you use, among other things. This is a, another key person we work with. So these are, this is a good start. I'm gonna bring something up here and I'll share my screen uh, because what I wanna do is use these answers to go into uh, some additional ideas of directing and just of filmmaking 
in general. So let me share my screen. And you guys can see this, the director's role in the shot. People see this? Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Yep. So I'm just gonna talk over this a little bit. I can't see you all right now because of my view, but as always will be the case today, if you have questions or anything, just jump right in. Uh, I think that there are three categories of rules of being a filmmaker. And I call them rules, which is what we're looking at. The second one, which you'll see is my rules. And the third one is real rules. And I think you'll understand what I'm talking about as I go through these. Here are the rules, and we're gonna talk about a lot of these today. So if you're looking at some of these words and you're like, I have no idea what film grammar is, some of you might, maybe some of you don't, don't sweat it, we're gonna talk about that. When you, uh, when you, if you read thinking ahead to the edit, that might not make sense. We'll talk a bit about that. But these four points in here are just a small sample. They're far from all of them, but a small sample of some of the rules of filmmaking. These are things that have been established over decades, over a century for now, by all sorts of directors before us from all over the world. And these are ideas and ways to put a film together in a coherent, artistic way that appeals to the audience that you are after. So uh, the name Hitchcock was already mentioned today, uh, and we will uh, use Hitchcock in a clip later. Hitchcock is often called the master of suspense, and one reason he's called this is because he uses his film grammar, how he moves us through a story visually, to pull the maximum amount of tension from his story and from his audience. Right now, again, if you don't know what these things I have up in front of you are, don't worry. This is the beginning and we're gonna get into it today. So first we have rules. Now, I'm a director and you guys are all directors. Any individual director is going to have her or his own rules as well. And these are not rules that were necessarily handed down from the generations. Maybe these are rules that you come to understand as being more important to you the more and more you direct. Some directors are gonna be primarily visual people. They're going to care much more about the mise-en-scene. Who can tell me what that term means? What is mise-en-scene? Someone jump in really quickly and tell me that. Everything on screen. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Everything on screen, perfect answer. Mise-en-scene, everything on screen. If you hit pause in a film and you look at what you're seeing, that's the mise-en-scene. The, the costumes, the makeup, the set, the lighting, the actors themselves, this is the mise-en-scene. The, act, the director is in charge of the mise-en-scene. For some directors, this is going to be the most important part of their job. They will love it the most and they will value it the highest. I love working on mise-en-scene, but for me, for my rules, performance and story are the two single most important things of a film and therefore the two single most important parts of a director's job. I need to make sure that the performances are believable, that they are true, that they are dramatic, and I need to make sure that story comes before all else in, or at least is more important than mise-en-scene. I'm more interested, this is quite subjective, I'm more interested in telling a story that an audience can latch onto than finding individual images that are more important than dramatic moments. These are my rules. This is, these are things that you guys will learn. You're gonna hear me use this word a lot today, believable. I'm gonna show you a clip for what I mean about when something, according to me, is believable or not believable. I think believable is a director's word. I think this is something that as directors, we ask ourselves on set all the time. We ask ourselves this in pre-production before we even shoot. We are asking, is this dialogue in the script believable? Would someone, would this character say this thing? We ask ourselves, is this action, this movement of character believable? Is this character's decision believable? This is a word that we'll return to a lot and I hope makes its way into your vocabulary as well. So we've got rules, we've got my rules, and we've got real rules. And the real idea in directing is that despite 
all of the things that have been said and taught and made throughout the whole history of cinema, all of those rules are made to be broken. We've all heard this phrase before. You learn the rules so you can break the rules, but you gotta learn them first. So you learn the rules, you break the rules. In a way, there aren't rules, but there are two rules according to me for real rules. No abuse on set and no harm on set. These things for me are unbelievably important. They might sound like something so far from what a director does to you guys, but believe me, they're not. One of your jobs as director is to run everyone. You run this machine. It can be a beautiful experience, everyone working with you. And if you do that in a way where no one is in uh, any harm or no one is being emotionally or physically abused, then your film will be elevated. Again, I realize that this part that I'm talking about right now maybe seems really different than anything related to film to a lot of you. It's not, it's part of film. It's part of being a director. <clears throat> Here are some other things, and I'm just gonna list these for now, and then we'll talk about them as we go, that a director looks for. These are what I call the intangibles of directing. By intangibles, I mean, you learn them by doing them. You learn them by being on set and working with other directors. You learn these by making mistakes. You learn these uh, with time. These aren't things that are gonna be in a film textbook. You're not gonna watch Psycho and learn how to lead or inspire confidence. You are gonna watch Psycho and learn a hell of a lot of other stuff though. Uh, but the director, in addition to the things you guys said, create, be the pilot, work with actors, great, great answers. In addition to that, this is the other stuff the director does. The director's got to inspire confidence. If you, the director, aren't excited and confident in your film, who's going to be? I mean, the answer to that is no one. I have been on a set in my life. I won't say which set, but I have been on a set in my life as an assistant director where I could tell the director didn't care about the project. And everyone else could tell. The decisions were a little lazy. The director wasn't speaking in a way that inspired confidence. The film didn't pull off that well. It didn't, it didn't come out well. The director didn't lead. The director didn't inspire confidence. That director didn't care. No one else on the shoot cared. The director's got to communicate. And to communicate, you've got to listen. I think that's a really important thing. A tricky thing about the word director is that it sounds like talking. Directing sounds like another word for talking. And I think that's something that a lot of us can slip into, meaning we might talk too much on set and listen too little on set. When I say on set, by the way, I'm talking about when we're shooting. So one thing that I'm always really careful of, and, and it's something that I've had to learn over the years, is that listening to the actors, listening to the director of photography, listening to the art director, for example, is as important as talking to them myself. Because I wanna communicate my idea and I'm not gonna understand if they have their own ideas that sync with mine or if they understand my idea without listening. Trusting, you gotta trust the people you work with. Uh, that's a, a, a small word but a huge concept. I think, again, a lot of this comes from uh, working with people over time, uh, but also trust should be part of trusting yourself, trusting the decisions you made. So as we keep going, one thing that I already mentioned on here, two things that I already mentioned on here are dramatic and believable. I told you that I will give you an example of what I mean by believable, because that's, I think, not a word we use much in regular life. Who can give me an example or tell me what, what maybe you think when you hear the words dramatic or truthful? What does it mean if a scene is dramatic? I think that is a word we use a lot, so what are we talking about? And what does it mean if a scene is truthful? And by the way, there can be a lot of different answers. There's not one answer for either of these. Anyone have any ideas? I think dramatic is when, when you exaggerate um a scene where in real life it's not going to be that that um that dramatic that dramatic <laughs> yeah good good so i like this idea of exaggeration it's a word we want to be careful of because sometimes exaggeration can lead to what a lot of times we think of as melodrama 
which is maybe overly dramatic, but I think your point is still well taken. This idea maybe that we need to look for additional beats. I'm gonna keep using words that some of you might not know and we'll slowly define them today. So I'll return to that word. That we keep use, that we, that we keep track as directors of what the beats of a scene are to lead us to, here's a different word than drama, to conflict, to maybe two or more people with opposing ideas or goals butting up against each other. Maybe here's one idea, an additional idea to what was just said of what drama is. What is a beat? B-E-A-T, what's a beat? It's another word I'll use a lot today. Has anyone heard the word in terms of filmmaking, in terms of drama? It's a word that if you're on a film shoot, you're gonna hear quite a bit. It's when, I think it's when you, um, when you, uh direct the actors when to say the words yeah I, I think you're i think you're on the right track here uh, maybe what maybe a way to broaden that definition is to think of the beats as the dots that fill in the entire scene so we have a whole scene let's think of a really simple scene let's think of um, i'll make one up let's think of a couple who is breaking up and they've been together for years and the entirety of the scene is the conflict that perhaps comes from one wanting to stay together and the other wanting to break up. Here's conflict. This leads to drama because there are opposing views. The beats that happen along the way are the individual changes or the individual attempts to reach their goal by these characters. This is also a screenwriting word. So I, I, I understand that some of you have, have uh, worked with or, or um, been in a screenwriting class. And so you probably heard this word there as well. This is a director's word too. To make something dramatic, we need to be, have a good understanding of what the beats of a scene are. The beats of a scene, again, are often are the moments where something changes, where something shifts. If I am the person in this scene that does not want to break up, maybe I try a different strategy to stay together. Maybe I start crying where I wasn't crying before, and I try to appeal to the other person's sympathy. That would be a beat. I would be trying something new. Maybe I decide that crying isn't working, and the meal that we are having at an expensive restaurant is quite expensive. And so I might try a new strategy. I might try to pay for the dinner. I don't know that that's a good idea to try to stay together, but it would be a beat in the scene. What does it mean when a scene or a film or a decision is truthful? I think this is a tricky one. What's truthful mean? And again, there can be a bunch of different answers for this. Any ideas? Well, guys. I'll give you, why don't I give you what I think about it? And then, and then maybe we can just let it sit in our heads. And uh, some of you guys might have different ideas. <clears throat> when I'm working on a film early, when I'm working on the screenplay, when I'm in pre-production, I have a few things aside for, aside in addition to the story that I wanna communicate. These are my themes, the broader things that I'm really interested in. Maybe it's a metaphor, maybe it's a message, these things must come across truthfully in order for them to, uh, in, order to, in order for my intentions to seem pure. And so when I think of truthful directing, I think of going back to those themes and thinking of the way to portray them on screen that is the most close, the closest to me, the closest to my original goals, ideas, themes. This is my idea of truthfulness. That can come out in a whole lot of different ways. It can come out in the mise-en-scene, something we mentioned already. Maybe I have an idea of replicating something from my own past. And in order to do that truthfully, I might need to control the mise-en-scene in a way that is actually relevant to my own past. Again, I'm just making up examples now. But these, this list that I have in front of you right now 
is again, quite a huge list, even though it's only what, one, two, three, four, five main points, five main points that encompass, in my opinion, so much of the things that over time you learn and you come to utilize on set as a director. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, but as I will, I'll keep saying this, just please guys jump in if you have anything that you wanna add or, or you have questions. This is a, a, a dictionary definition of what a shot is. I will probably say this one time and never say this again because this is a mouthful. Here's a shot, an uninterrupted series of frames consisting of size, angle, and general mise-en-scene. Right, so far we've, we've defined this term, mise-en-scene. And if you remember, one of you correctly responded and said, mise-en-scene is what you see. And there can be so many things that we see in an image. We're about to talk about these things, size and angle. I think we talk about shots a lot. We all have phones with cameras, most of us do, I imagine. And we just turn on the video function, hit record, and we've taken a shot. That's a shot. So we all, I think, innately understand what a shot is. I think the, uh, the thing that I'm after here and that we should be after is why the shot that we're using. So we need to go beyond just point and shoot or looks cool, which sometimes is a good reason, but we need to move beyond that and move into why are we selecting the shot that we're selecting. What I'm transitioning into right now, by the way, is film grammar. And film grammar was on that list that I showed you a little while ago. So, this is basic film language. <clears throat> These are stills from a bunch of different films. You might recognize some of them. And, uh, Let's talk about a few of these. There, there are specific terms for these. We'll define them. So first of all, who can give me a definition or what type of shot uh, shot A is? What type of shot is this? Can anyone describe shot A? Establish shot? Yeah, establishing is good. It, it, it is most likely an establishing shot. An establishing shot usually establishes what? Location. Location? Good answer. Establishes location. What else could an establishing shot uh, establish? What else could it show us? Movement. Movement? Is it, movement's a very good answer, actually. Uh, traditionally, it's not the main function of an establishing shot, and I'll show you an example of that later in the class today. So file that answer away in your brain, because I will return to that. But still, a good answer nonetheless. Location, kind of movement. How about time of day? Usually, establishing shots tell us is something day or something night. My, my reproduction of this still image isn't the best, so it's a little hard to tell, but this is, a, this is a daytime exterior scene. It's an establishing shot in that way. It establishes time, it establishes place. How else can we define this shot, shot A? Extreme long shot. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, I heard extreme long shot. That's a good answer. Yeah, really good. Um, so from I think that was from Ivan, who appears to be in like the Wild West over there. Nice background. Um, so you, so uh, yeah, Leone. So we've got we've got Hitchcock, we've got Leone. Let's get some uh, some more cinematic backgrounds. I should have come prepared. So we've got an extreme long shot. Uh, you could call this an extreme wide shot. Uh, and the important thing here in terms of why, which is how I started, what I want to get into, is to know that each shot up here, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, but we'll just continue to talk about A for now, each shot on the, in front of you hides something and each shot reveals something. So we already mentioned, you guys already mentioned, some of the things that are revealed in shot A. Uh, the, the place. We can see that we're outside. That is revealed. Someone mentioned movement. We don't get a, 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 um, a detailed sense of movement, but because we can see a person, and because I know you can't see my body, but I'll try to do it, because you can see their arms swinging, you get an idea of movement. 
I mentioned time of day. What else in here is, is known or revealed? What else do we know about this scene? Let's call it a scene when we look at this image, shot A. That he is alone? Good, yeah, good answer. That this person is alone, yeah. And, and I, couldn't, I didn't hear the beginning of that answer. It's a very good answer. I didn't hear the beginning. So I couldn't hear if you said he or she, but I'll tell you one thing, I'll jump ahead and tell you one thing that we don't know is really too much about this person. I don't know if that's a man or a woman. How old is this person? Someone tell me how old the person, approximately the person in, in shot A is. I, I mean, I have no idea. I have no clue, right? So, and if you were to take a guess, that probably means either A, you've seen the film that this is from and you're cheating, or B, you're just taking a wild guess. But part of the point is that in shot A, just like in all of the shots in front of you, some information is given, some information is hidden. And this concept, hiding and giving information, is one of the fundamental concepts of deciding what type of shot it is we want in any given moment. This is like key number one. When I sit down with my director of photography, my DOP, I'm often, before we're even shooting the film, talking in these terms. And sometimes we'll very specifically say things like this. We'll say, well, we don't want the audience to know who that person is yet, so we're not gonna go to a close-up, shot E, medium close maybe. We're not gonna go to that shot because that would tell us who the person is, and we wanna hide that information right now because this is a suspenseful moment as to who. There are different forms of suspense. Suspense, for me, is a question that has yet to have an answer. This is an idea of what suspense can be. Suspense can be who. Suspense can also be, look at, look at shot F, where. These are different forms of suspense. And we as filmmakers, one of our many jobs as directors, one of our many jobs is to figure out what part of film grammar, what shot, in this instance, is the best one to suit that form of suspense. I think when a lot of us, and I include myself in this, when a lot of us hear the word suspense when it relates to film, we think of, I think of mysteries, I think of who's the killer, I think of someone hiding in the shadows. And, and that, that's good, I have those ideas in my head for a reason, but almost any narrative fiction film operates on the level of suspense. If we go back to that scene that I made up about five minutes ago, and we have two people having dinner together, and one wants to break up and the other does not, there is suspense in that scene. The question remains unanswered during the scene. Will they break up? Suspense is a fundamental part of fiction filmmaking. And what we're doing now is tying the visual idea of directing to this broader idea of suspense. Let's go from shot A to shot F, which I already started talking about. So if you guys look at shot F, what information is known in shot F? What is already revealed? She's going to take some pill. Good, okay. And that was actually two answers, which are good answers. The first thing you said was she. That's the first answer. It's a woman. That is the first answer. We can see that and we cannot see that in A, right? And by the way, if we wanted to jump ahead, G, we can, I can tell this is a man, but you might be able to see how an extreme close-up like shot G could also be a tool to hide who, but in a very different way. In shot A, I'm so distanced that I can't tell who, but I can see the surroundings. In shot G, I could be so close that I cannot tell who, nor can I tell the surroundings. And so now I'm operating on multiple levels at the same time. But this past answer for shot F was quite good. So you said she, and you said it looks like she's about to eat something. That's great. I don't know if she's about to eat something or if she's examining it, but the point is you can see that she's holding something. We cannot do that in shot A. You can see that she's holding it close to her. I don't know exactly how to define her emotion or if we look at the emotion in shot E or D. I mean, we could come up with some words, but the more important idea is that I can see a type of emotion in these shots, D, E, and F, and I can see zero emotion from the face in shot A. 
I can see maybe another form of emotion in shot A. This is a wintry landscape. The trees are bare. The image of shot A looks cold to me. Someone mentioned that this person is alone. Maybe for all of these reasons and the fact that we are in an extreme long shot, shot A gives me a compositional emotion. It gives me the emotion of loneliness, of distance. These are emotions as well as visual ideas. Where in shot F, I don't get much emotion from the surroundings. I get more of my emotion from the woman's, our first point of information, from her face. Where is this woman in shot F? Yep, I can see some of you shaking your head and I'm right there with you. No clue. I don't know where she is. She inside? Is she outside? I mean, I think she's inside, but that is a blank slate back there. She could be outside and she could be against some surface or against the dark of night and being lit by a street light or something otherwise. I'm, I'm not really sure. And that's part of the point. So one of our big points here in film grammar, again, that is what we are doing right now, is deciding why. And one way to decide why is to think of what is hidden and what is revealed and what matters to be hidden and revealed when. Another thing that we sort of slipped in here along the way is emotion. What emotion do I want to draw from my audience at a certain point? This is part of drama. I want my audience to feel, right? I want them to feel something. Maybe I want them to laugh. Maybe I want them to feel terror. Maybe I want them to feel romance or romantic notions, but I want them to feel. And as we demonstrated both in shot A and shot F, there are different emotional values associated with these different shots. So here we have an extreme long shot. Here, who can give me a definition for shot B? What kind of shot is this? Full shot. Say again? Full shot. Full shot, full shot's a good answer. This is from the Seventh Seal, uh, and I believe Max von Sydow from Seventh Seal recently passed away. Yeah. Great, great film, great actor. Yeah. Uh, Full shot is usually defined as head to toe. This to my eye is maybe a little wider than a full shot. Um, but nonetheless, I think you could fit this into the definition of full shot. Um, head to toe, I think, is more traditionally the example. Shot C is a tricky one. You don't see this shot as much anymore. Um, does anyone know a, a name for this? I can think of two. Cowboy shot. Awesome, yeah. Usually one person gets that, and that's great. A cowboy shot is one term. Sometimes you'll hear people call this an American. Sometimes you'll hear people call this a gunslinger. And, and because of the first answer, cowboy and gunslinger, you might have some idea of why uh, American Western films, cowboy films, dominated the film industry for an early part of the 20th century in Hollywood. And one of the classic ways to frame shots was just below the gun and the gun hung from the cowboy's or the sheriff's waist. And so you would frame the base of the gun, therefore the cowboy shot. It's not a, as common of a shot anymore. Shot D, Rashomon, anyone know what, what shot size this is? That's what we're talking about, by the way. I don't know if I said that specifically. Shot size. Medium shot. Medium shot, waist up. Medium shot is a pretty classic always the same. And I know you guys can't see my bottom hand. Maybe I'll back up a little so you can. So you can see me here. Oh, got to back way up. Here's a medium. So you can just see my lower hand. It's on my waist, this hand, it's on my waist. And my top hand is on my head. And we'll talk about that a little bit, the top of the frame, the top of the shot. Here we have a, a close-up or a medium close-up, shot E. Uh, so you can see me. Here, shot E. I'm doing this, what you see me doing now, because I often do this, we often do this on set. The DOP will look over to me and be like, what are we, are we here, are we here? Are we in a choker close-up, shot F, or a, a, some, sometimes people call it a tight close-up, or are we, yep, in a, in a medium close-up? Uh, shot F, maybe like I said, a tight close-up or a choker close-up. Shot G, an extreme close-up, and we're just seeing uh, this character's eyes. So some of that, again, is just film language, shot size. Shot size is a part of film language or film grammar. But I think the important takeaway for me is the idea of what is hidden, what is revealed, 
and what is emotional from shot to shot. This is a two shot. Why is this a two shot? Pretty easy answer here. Because there are two people. Because there are two people. Great. Yep. It's the, it's the easiest one. Usually when we're on set, we talk about two shots, two people in the shot. We talk about three shots and we don't really talk about beyond that. Four shots, five shots. This doesn't exist as much. That's usually because we're talking about crowds and we're, and we're, and we're moving beyond just these small intimate conversations. So let's use this still from on the waterfront and talk about more ideas of film grammar. Uh, what is the angle of this shot? By the way, I'm gonna do something right now that you'll see, you guys can all see me, am I correct on the view? Yep, yeah? okay, cool. Um, then you're, you'll see me do a lot. This right here, this or this is my camera. And some, some people will do this. But this is really, really useful. I do this on set a lot. I'm kind of going around and looking at shots. Yeah, Giovanni's doing it. You'll see everyone do this on shoots. And I'm about to, in a moment, show you why it's useful. Um, but before I do that, let's talk about the angle of this shot. We haven't yet talked about angle. We just talked about shot size. We know this is a two shot. What is the angle of the camera? And even if you don't know the exact term, maybe you can describe it. Eye level. I level, good answer. Okay, so you're really on the right track and it's a great way to think about angle. Are we above eye level? So here's where I'll use my camera. Are we above eye level? Are we eye level or are we below eye level? So you can see how this can be really useful, right? And think about what a shortcut this is on a shoot. I look across the room at my DOP and I say, we're in a close up above eye level. He already has a good idea of what that shot's gonna be. So. I think that this is a little bit below eye level, actually, just a little bit. It's hard to tell, but imagine if that's Marlon Brando in the center of the frame, and imagine if he just turned his head and looked at us, he would be looking just a little over the camera. So for me, this is a little bit of a low angle. That's what below eye level is, a little, uh, a I would call this a slight low angle. What other ways, in what other ways can you describe the composition of this shot. I just said two additional things. We know it's a two shot. Now we know it's a slight low angle. And we also know that Brando's character is in center, about approximately the center of the shot. He's about center frame. Are there any other ways that you guys can think of to describe this shot? I think Marilyn Brando's um, uh, space is a lot bigger than the, the girl. So yeah, it looks good. like the, the Marilyn Brando is dominating in this great. shot somehow? It's a great answer. It's a great answer. Brando just occupies more of the frame. I mean, think of it as a percentage. There is 100% of this shot that exists. And Marlon Brando, if we were to cut him out of the shot, he occupies, I don't know, 60% of the shot. So he dominates. It's a really nice way to say it. Really good. Low angle, Marlon Brando, the dominant character. He's basically center frame, but a little bit frame left. He's like center frame left. We are in a two shot. I'll give you some others so we can move on to some of the other shots. This is Eva Marie Saint. She is in profile in the foreground. And Marlon Brando is in three quarters. So here is head on. You can't even see my face because the camera's pointing directly at me. Here is three quarters. It's hard to do on Zoom. <laughs> and profile is shooting at the side of my face. So we have, uh, let me just see if we're seeing any chats. So we have uh, a slight low angle two shot where Eva Marie Saint is in profile frame right in the foreground and Marlon Brando is in three quarters frame center left in the middle ground. This would be a pretty nice way to define this shot, but we haven't said shot size yet, which we just did. What shot size is this? Is this a full shot? Is this an extreme close-up? What is this? Medium, medium shot. Medium. So, so it's a little tighter than a medium. Think of a medium as your waist up. So it's a little tighter or a little closer than that. I would call this a medium or a mid close-up. You might even call it a loose mid close-up. But a medium shot is almost, it is always, for me, it's the most easily defined shot. It's waist to top of head. But good, good, you're on the right track. So now we've incorporated a lot of different compositional elements into one. 
which is part of the definition of what a shot is in the first place. Let's look at some more. Here's a low angle. This is from the classic film Nosferatu. And we just defined what a low angle is. The camera is below eye level. Here we are at an extreme low angle. We're in a full shot. We're head to toe on Nosferatu. How about we talk about more of the psychological ideas behind this? Why might we use a low angle? Inferior. Yeah, good. We are inferior to this character. He looms over us. He's taller than us. He's bigger than us. He is maybe uh, uh, intimidating to us. Good. Here is another one. Here's a high angle. This is from Bonnie and Clyde. And so a high angle, now we look down on them. And, and the reverse psychological idea would also be true. If in a low angle shot, we look up and maybe we are a little intimidated or even scared, in a high angle shot, we are superior and we look down. We look on characters who maybe appear to be vulnerable. And if you know the film Bonnie and Clyde, you might understand why these characters appear vulnerable. Think of it, there's a simple human way to think of this. Think about standing next to someone who's much taller than you, and you crane your neck and look up at them. You, I feel a little small when that happens. And, and if I stand next to someone who's much shorter than me, I kind of look down on them, and I feel taller than I am. The same concept is true when you bring in actors and a camera. Now we're just thinking about how to combine a lot of these elements that we've already talked about, shot size, angle, composition, in order to bring our meaning through. This is like the true definition of what a shot really should do. I'm not interested in that long definition I read to you at the beginning because it doesn't really talk about the whys and, and hows of things. And that's, I think that's more important to us as directors. Why are we doing what we're doing? So let me go to one, maybe two last ones. Here is an over the shoulder shot. Uh, this is from Hitchcock's Vertigo, which we will see a, a clip from shortly. Uh, and I'll just talk about this one so I can get to some other concepts. So over the shoulder itself, hopefully is a bit obvious. We're over looking over Jimmy Stewart's shoulder. Now we can talk about all of the other things that we've already mentioned in here, that this is Kim Novak, and she appears to be in, a, in about a medium close-up. Uh, we could talk about angle, et cetera, but let's talk about some new things. First of all, when I look at this image, whether I, I have seen the film, but even if you have not seen the film, when I look at this image, I get a sense of uh, drama and a sense of emotion in here. And I think I get that from several different, from, for several different uh, reasons. Let me point out a few, some that I'm sure you guys can see. One is this which is the space above Kim Novak, the woman, the space above her head. This is called headspace or headroom. And she has quite a bit of it. There's a lot of room over her. It makes her seem really small, kind of shrunken down in the frame. It gives her a little less power in the shot than Jimmy Stewart has, who has kind of what I might call proper headspace. The top of the image is at the top of his head. Headspace or headroom can be a compositional tool to say something about the character. Let's also look at the character's body language. Jimmy Stewart leans forward with his finger pointing towards her a little intimidatingly. Kim Novak leans back. I know you can't see me, but look at her arms, including her arm reflected in the mirror. She leans back against a surface like she's trapped. Alfred Hitchcock and his DOP made the decision to put her up against a wall. So she further appears to be trapped. Imagine for a moment if this were open space behind her. She wouldn't have anything to lean on, therefore she might not appear as trapped. And right now what we're really talking about is appearances. She might still be trapped, but part of our job is to match these things, the appearance and the actuality. Now, in the mirror, you guys can all see that she is reflected in what appears to be what looks like a door is also there. So let's do an, a, a really quick imagination exercise if you can. Right now, we can also see what looks like another door, and it's right here. And the man, Jimmy Stewart, appears to be blocking it. He's, he's positioned over top of that door. Now imagine, here's my camera, and it is over Jimmy Stewart's shoulder. Now imagine if the camera 
just moves a little bit, about maybe 90 degrees to the left. And we are looking at them both in profile. Can you guys imagine that? We're looking at them both in profile. The other thing that would occur if we did that is that this door here, which now appears to be blocked by the man, would instead appear to be between them. And it would appear, I'm using that word a lot, as though she now has access to the door. She would appear to have an exit. Therefore, the idea of her trappedness would be lessened. It would be lost a little bit. The point is that in the reality of this room, if we were all just in this room with these two characters, no camera, no movie, maybe we could tell that she could walk out this door at any time. But because of the positioning of the camera and the positioning of the actors, in this still image, she is made to appear more trapped than she actually might be. Therefore, the positioning of these things, we're talking about camera placement and composition, is of the utmost importance. This is what defines mood, emotion, drama to, for a good percentage of the film. Is that, is that clear, what I just described? Please, if it's not, feel free to type in the chat or ask some questions about it. Yeah, clear. Cool. Okay. One last one, and then we'll get out of here. This is from The Graduate, and I only want to show you this to show you how not all shots are created equal. Both of these shots are over-the-shoulder shots, but they're quite different, actually. In the last shot, our character, whose face we could see, was backed up and trapped. This character seems to be standing comfortably. Maybe he's a bit nervous, but he's not backed up against a surface. If you know the film, this is Mrs. Robinson in the foreground. Her neck and shoulder create a frame within the larger frame, a frame within a frame. This character maybe appears to be trapped, but in a different way. Rather than being trapped by not having access to the door, rather than being trapped by being pushed up against a wall, using some of the production or the, the location, he appears to be trapped simply by the way that the director, Mike Nichols, has set up this shot. I don't even know from this image what is off to the right. For all I know, there's a door here. For all I know, there are 30 other people here. If you know the film, you know what's actually happening. But the point being that composition can lead us in certain directions. Camera placement can lead us in certain directions. The way we position our characters in the frame, this big rectangle being the frame, can lead us in certain directions. Okay, I'm gonna jump off my screen share for a moment. So, any questions as of right now? I'm gonna continue on, on this track, but, but bring up some different ideas. All right, so. Was that you, Giovanni? Yeah, yeah, I uh, just said. Uh, okay, question. okay, just checking. So let's, let's, let's make a little transition because I told you that I'm gonna use this word believable a lot, and I am. It's one of my favorite words, especially when I'm shooting. And I wanna give you an example of something that I don't find believable. I don't really always like to, um, to use a film and, and criticize it. I'm much more for film and celebrating the beauties of film. Uh, but I'm gonna bring up a clip from a film. I, I like the film, but a clip that I don't think works. And I'm gonna use it to demonstrate the example of believability. So this clip, which unfortunately I don't have subtitles embedded into, but it doesn't matter. This clip is from the original version, I don't know if there was a remake yet, of The Girl Who Played With Fire. So give me one second. Mm -hmm. Let me just cue this up. And uh, then we can talk about believability, but we'll also talk about a few other things. Uh, so, it's not David Fincher version, right? It's not the Fincher version. It's the... Uh, ooh, Kenny not the Fincher version. Not the, yeah, not the Fincher version. I can't remember. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mute it because I'm gonna talk over it a little bit. Um, and as I said, there aren't subtitles, but I don't think it really matters too much for our exercise. So even if you don't know the uh, story, you guys can all see this screen right now with the with the woman. Yeah, cool. Uh, it doesn't matter. So let let me just play it. 
Um, and uh, and as I talk, I think what I'll what I'll do for now is talk a little bit about shot size and angle, so we can get a sense for it. I'm not going to talk too much about camera movement, uh, but you can see that we're a little looser than a medium shot. We're in something like an American on her right now, actually, like a cowboy shot, uh, which, as I already said, is fairly rare. But nonetheless, there's an example of one. Uh, it's an excellent actor here, Lume Rapace. Uh, we'll, we'll get into talking about point of view in a little bit and what we just saw could have been a point of view shot. Now we're at a high angle. You guys should all be able to see that if she turned back and looked at us, she would have to look up. There's a medium shot, but we're getting wider. Notice, notice all the headspace above her. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that would tell us something about her. Here we don't have it in this close-up in profile. So from a narrative standpoint, we can just see that this character is searching for something. Now, we will cut to these other guys who will become important. I don't want to talk too much about editing today. It's getting a little too far ahead. But just so you know, what we are seeing right now is called a cross-cut. We're go moving between two people in different locations, but we understand that it's happening at the same time and that they will probably meet. I bet you guys all guessed that already. She and those guys on the motorcycles are gonna meet. The crosscut communicates that to us. So here is, there's uh, the character in a medium close-up, and we're getting pretty close to the point that I wanna mention. So let me, just let this play a little bit more. We'll talk about insert shots in a little. And um, what we just saw when we saw what looked like an extreme close up on this box, and there's another one, her photo, we would call that an insert shot, I-N-S-E-R-T, an insert. An insert is usually, or is, a small detail, small but usually, hopefully, important detail, often on an object in a scene. Okay, so here comes our important point of this scene. And let's just let it play. So we've already seen this ladder. This is where she found those files. And by the way, I'm going to criticize a part of this scene, but there are some parts of this scene that are really excellent. And here's the point where, as I already said, we knew these guys were going to meet, and here's the end of the cross cut. And here comes the important part for us. Watch her eyes shift. There. We know what she's looking at, I think, because we've just watched this scene. She's looking to this bag. And here we'll see it there. And we can talk about how we know that this bag is important, but I'm just gonna pause it right here. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share for now, but I may come back in, but it's better if I can see all of you guys. Here's a scene that, that has some really awesome stuff to it, and I am gonna talk about the things that I really like. But let's talk about the idea of believability. Okay, there is one thing, and it's only one thing, but for me, it is really important in this scene. There is one thing that I do not believe. And you guys might have different answers than me, and, and those could be fine. I'm curious if any of you have something. I think it's a large part of the scene. Um, and I wanna talk about not only what it is, but why I find it so important that we as directors keep track of these things. Did anyone find anything? It's okay if you did not. Did anyone find anything in this scene that you don't believe? And you might start, still not know what I mean by that. And if you don't, don't worry. You're about to find out. Let, let me ask it this way. <clears throat> let's, let's go through the scene. What is this character's goal in the scene? You, don't, you might not know the film, but you can figure this out from watching the scene. What is her goal? What does she want? To find the, to find the document. Good. Exactly right to find the documents. This is absolutely her goal. If you haven't seen the film, you don't know why she needs them, but it doesn't matter. We know her goal, okay? So important answer number one. Here's what will soon be important answer number two. 
when you guys give me an answer. Why, how do we know that those documents are important? How do we know it? Because she spent uh, like a half of the scene looking for it. Good. Good answer. And there's more answers. That's a great answer. She spends half the scene looking for these things. Good. How else do you guys know that these documents are important? Her, her eyes, uh, her eyes switch when uh, the bad guy. I don't know. I, I think that's the bad guy. Come. Yeah, exactly. It's the bad guy, and 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 she and her eyes switch. She, he he's uh, a villain. He's maybe violent, but she's still looking at the documents. Good. How else do we know that the documents are important? From the insert. From the insert. Why does the insert tell me that they are important? It's a good answer. But what about the insert shot? tells me they are important. Uh, with her emotions shows that it is important. Good. So actually there's two, there's two answers contained in there. One, one insert shot shows me her photo. The documents are about her. They must be important to her. Two, her reaction, her emotion tells me that this is a meaningful um, object to her. I'll give, you, I'll give you another reason why the documents are important. They're hidden. They're carefully hidden. She searches the whole interior of this house and cannot find them. And she has to take a ladder and climb up and search in a hidden compartment. For all of these reasons, the documents are important. And it is important for us as an audience to understand that. But because we're all directors in here, it is important for us as directors to make sure the audience understands this. I bet, I have not read this script, I would guess that in the script, it said some of these things. It said that, um, I can't remember the character's name, but that she goes into this house, it said that she looks around, and maybe it says that they were hidden. But it's the director's job to show me how hard she looks while working with the actor. It's the director and actor's job to show me how long, someone mentioned that it's half the scene, how long it takes her to find these documents. It's the director's job to show me how well hidden the documents are. These are the things that I think the director has done extremely well, extremely well. And how do I know that? Because we all understand it. I bet all of you, even if you couldn't define why, I bet all of you knew she was looking for documents and the documents were important. This sounds easy. That's not easy. As a director, you have to figure out all of these tiny details. Where is the ladder that she will climb to find the documents? Where will she, what will her reaction be working with the performance when she sees her face in this photo? This doesn't happen by accident. You direct these moments. So let's go back to believability. She is looking for documents. These documents are important. Put yourself in the character's shoes. If you are searching for something that is really important to you, really important to you, and you find it, are you gonna put it down? Are you gonna put it down and walk away? No. Especially if it's not that heavy? How do I know it's not that heavy? How do I know? You guys know it too. How do we know that those documents are not very heavy? The paper. It's just paper, good. The object itself, how else do you know? When he puts it down, he doesn't, yeah. good. Uh, he good. doesn't she, need so much support. Yeah, there's not much effort. She just swings it off of her back. It fits in this pack. She swings it off of her back and puts it down. I ask you that because there's no excuse for her to put them down. I think her putting the documents down is a not believable way to build drama that is therefore false or not truthful. Do you guys see these things? I'm trying to connect the dots that I brought up earlier. I'm trying to bring up believability, drama, and truthfulness all together. So let's say that again, because I think this is, this is such an important part of this scene. She puts the documents down and I don't believe it. It is not believable because they are so important to her. So I do not believe it. The director's intention of putting these down is to build drama because drama comes from conflict. She wants the documents, the man blocks the documents. This is not truthful because I don't believe it to begin with. 
So in my opinion, while this scene succeeds on so many beautiful levels, it fails at a critical moment. And this is the director's job. This is a huge part of the director's job. So let's put ourselves in the director's shoes and let's kind of talk through directing this scene right now. You get this actor to the point where she walks outside with her bag on. And you're the director and so you know, okay, I need to raise the drama or the tension. So I need Lisbeth, that's the character's name. So I need Lisbeth to have a confrontation with these bikers. But I can't have her put her bag down because it's not believable. So how do you do all of the above? How do you keep it believable, but still raise the drama and conflict, have her still have a confrontation with the bikers, but never put the bag down? What do you do? This, by the way, as some of you are thinking of answers, these are the rapid questions we are asking ourselves on shoots. It's fun. How do you do this scene? Hey, what would you do? I would, uh, uh, maybe, uh, oh, no, no, yeah, go first, whatever it is. Uh, make her fall from the stairs and she is injured. So when he confronts the gang motors, mm -hmm. it will mm -hmm. be the drama. Mm -hmm. Okay, good answer, good answer. So maybe she falls from the stairs and then she's injured. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give one issue I have with that, and maybe you wouldn't know this from the whole film, but this is a very physically able character. She is a character who's, uh, she's a good fighter. She's stronger than she looks. And so well, I think it's a good answer, and you would not know this if you don't know the film or the book, but I think if she fell, I might think, hmm, it seems maybe a little, like a, a little unbelievable just to get drama. It's a good answer nonetheless. And I have the context that you do not have. Let's, let's, let's get some other answers. What else, how else would you, I'm asking you to redirect this scene, the end of it. Who's got a way to do it? Um, I would, um, so the girl probably looks, before the, the bike gang, gang comes, she mm -hmm. just about to finish uh, packing the documents mm -hmm. and she looks rushed and then mm -hmm. um, give a, a close up for the, uh, at the bike gang, looking mm -hmm. the same way as, um, looking suspicious of the bag, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like as the girl, something mm -hmm. like that probably. It's good. The thing that I like the most about this answer is maybe manipulating the timing, which is what you started by saying. And, and, and so I think, I think for me, that's the best part of this answer. It's a good answer. Pardon me. One thing to remember, whether you write your own screenplay or someone else writes it for you and gives it to you, is that you can change things. And one of our jobs as director is to decide what should be changed. And if it's a good screenplay, the answer is usually not much. And what should uh, stay the same. And so one thing you could change in this scene, which is, which is basically the beginning of that answer, is the timing. You could bring these bikers there earlier. You could have them interrupt her at a more vulnerable position. How about this one? I, it's not a perfect answer, but I'll combine the last two answers. What if the bikers arrive when she is uh, holding the ladder? And, and it, it just gives them one less, one less thing to do, one way to sneak up on her. Her back has to be to the bikers because the wall is facing the other way of the, of the driveway where they drive up. One answer, it's not a perfect answer, but just to put you in a, in a way of thinking. Let's, let's maybe get one other idea here because I think this is an important thing to talk about for directors. How else might you attack this scene? How else might you try this scene? Uh, uh, hey Neil, so yep. uh, I don't know uh, what, uh, whose house uh, the girl came, is, is it the, the biker's uh, house or like a safe house, I don't know, but for sure the bikers know that house and know that she will come, uh, uh, come to their house, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are two bikers, uh, I will put Good. one bikers uh, like that's in that when the first uh, bikers talk to the girl, and mm -hmm. I rather put the other one, the the bigger, the bigger yep. bikers, uh, 
to the to behind uh, in the yep. in the back of the the girl's character so it will Great. build tension and it's more easy to uh, the biker to take that documents that it is important it, it's a great answer it's a great answer so you would change what what you what what uh what you're talking about is changing the blocking uh blocking and i will only talk about it a little bit today because it's a huge topic i love talking about blocking in films blocking is the movement or the positioning of characters in relation to the camera this is the blocking and and there's a bigger definition and a bigger discussion to be had but this last answer is a recommendation to change the blocking sometimes you'll hear people call it the staging of the scene and so let's just readdress that answer it was quite good one biker comes from one direction and the other biker is positioned or blocked or staged on the other direction therefore surrounding lisbeth so she might and i'll just uh, uh, continue with this answer. She might keep the bag on her back the whole time. So maybe the drama does not come from can she get the documents again, but it comes from can she escape with the documents. There's still drama. There's still a conflict. The documents remain of the utmost importance. Maybe it becomes a more interesting scene. Maybe it's harder to fight with these with this bag on her back. I'm not sure. It's, it's a very good answer. My point is not that there are easy ways to make this a better scene. My point is actually that it's really difficult to do this. And that at every beat, what we're talking about here are beats, right? Lizbeth walks into the room. That's a beat. She surveys it. There's a change. She's thinking. Lizbeth walks outside and sees the ladder. That's a beat. She understands something new. There's a change. The bikers pull up behind her. That's a beat. There's a change. She's in danger now. What we are doing while we are preparing the film and while we are shooting the film is actively, and by actively I mean in the moment, during the shoot, figuring out do these things work? Is there a better way to be doing this? Can I build drama in a more truthful and believable and exciting way? Have I squeezed the most drama out of this scene, but kept truthful to myself and kept everything believable? These are hard questions to answer. You guys are doing a really great job. One of the things that's really fun and difficult on set is doing it by yourself. You have collaborators, but a lot of directing takes place up here. Doing it by yourself and doing it rapidly. That's also why we train. We work, we take classes, we read, we watch films, we work on sets, we work with friends, we make our short films. This is, these are the, essentially the muscles that we're building in order to be able to make these decisions in an intelligent and rapid way. Is the idea that I'm talking about with believability pretty clear? Yes. Awesome. This is just one example. There are other examples where you might be watching a film and you might say, ah, that's not believable. But you might watch it with someone else who says, I don't know, I totally bought that moment. I totally believe that moment. Sometimes things can be subjective. Of course, art is subjective, right? And so the tricky part for us is to figure out what does it matter to us? Because we are the directors of the film. And therefore, what decisions should follow? Okay. Let's go to another clip here. And I told you that I was going to return to Vertigo. <clears throat> so let's bring up, it's not the best quality, but I think it should work. Can, Can I bring up this uh, clip? Please, please, please. Question, Neil? Please. Yeah, yeah. just me. So uh, what do you think the, the moment of anticipation? Is it, is it the same word with the suspense? Mm -hmm. moment of yeah. because in screenwriting I, I I found a lot I find a lot the moment of anticipation creating sus sus suspense mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so how is yeah. the director's word uh, yeah. Yeah. from you I think uh, uh, I think this is something I would not use on set but I like the the question because it, it leads to an important idea. So there are things that we talk about 
now, moment of anticipation, suspense, etc., uh, that are, in my opinion, the ideas that we cover in pre-production on a film. Mm-hmm. When I'm in pre-production on a film, I've, get, I've either, either written the script or been given the script, and I'm sitting down with my collaborators, and I'm doing, I'm doing a hell of a lot of work. I'm sitting down with my DOP and I'm talking about exactly what Giovanni just asked me about. I'm talking about, okay, so this moment needs to be suspenseful enough and I want the audience to be feeling maybe anxiety or I want them to be anticipating Mm -hmm. that the character will do this, but we're really going to show them doing that. Mm -hmm. We're having these conversations. In pre-production, I'm sitting down with my actors and and maybe not sitting down. We're, We're rehearsing scenes and we're trying to build the beats and build a character, maybe to build suspense, maybe to build anticipation. But my point is that I try to do a lot of that stuff in the early going. And then when I get onto set, when I get onto the shoot, my my hope in a perfect world is that I've done so much preparation, so like an exhaustive amount of preparation, that 90 to 99% of my energy is directed to the actors. Yep. I, I, I check the shot. I talk to the DOP, I look at the camera movement, I check the mise-en-scene, sure, of course, I do, of course I do all of that. But 90 to 99% of my energy is directed to the actors because preparing the shot, checking the camera movement, checking the mise-en-scene was most of what I did in pre-production. So when it comes down to moment of anticipation, as your example, I hope that, I've, I hope that I'm past that when yeah. I get to a shot. And if I say to someone, if I have to say to an actor, okay, now you're going to be anticipating this. Most actors, most good actors would look at me and stop saying, and and they would be thinking or they would say, don't tell me how to act. Mm. Just, just direct me, which is, which is a, I realize that might sound like two tricky things to a lot of you. (laughs) Um, But if we have the chance to talk again, we can talk about working with actors. Um, My point again, being, that I need to have established this rapport, this communication, this mm. level of trust already, mm. that I'm, I'm past that and I don't need to do these things. Yeah. So that's the long answer. The short answer is, I think that's a screenwriter's word and not a director's word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, I'm a screenwriter too, so I use it. <laughs> okay, me too. <laughs> is it? Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> We're the same, I'm a director. Yeah, writer, director, but at a, at a certain point, yeah. You have to take like one hat off your writer hat yeah, and put yeah. the director hat on, you know? It, it's and for very me, hard. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, it's very but, difficult. It's yeah. very difficult. But I do agree with you. Like, uh, like uh, when I when I make, made my last film, like uh, pre production is very important, you know? Yep. Like, uh, yep. we prepare the shot and miss on scene and everything, yep. you know? It's kind of yep. like uh, how the lighting, how the sad. So I, yep. I do agree with you with the. Uh, it has it has to it has uh, to finish with the pre-production, and then the shooting. I agree with you, with like we hundred percent with the actor. Yeah, yeah, but definitely. It's very hard if we if we mix that bigger complex things in the yeah. shooting day. So I I I, I feel it also. <laughs> I but I agree and well said. I, I just just as one other example of this, I just. Um, screened a, a good friend of mine's, uh, mine's film. He just, he just finished uh, his second feature film and it's done quite well mm. on the film festival circuit. Yeah. So for one of my classes here in Prague, we screened his film and then we did a Q and A with him. It was quite good. Mm. And he, he gave like such a great answer. This student asked this amazing question. He was asking about how uh, my friend, the director was creating these, these visual metaphors through his compositions. It was a very good question, very intelligent. And, and, uh, and it made sense, the question. He, he asked it better than I just said it. And, and my friend said, uh, thank you for the question. It's great, but I didn't ever think of the word visual metaphor on set. And if I did, I would have been doing my job wrong because then I would have just been wasting energy that could have gone to the actors. That was his answer. I thought it was a great answer. Yeah, yeah. He, he's not, he's not saying you, that he... Yeah. Ne- and he, do, he doesn't mean that he neglected the camera. Yeah. A lot of us in here, I'm sure, I do too, love the yeah, camera. Yeah. We love, love how films yeah. look. But it's not his point. His point is you do that work before, and yeah. then it frees you up. It frees your brain up yeah. to work with the actors. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Thanks for the question.
So let's look at this clip from Vertigo. Uh, this is a short clip, and uh, this, in my opinion, is uh, just such a great example of many different things, all of which we will discuss. So let me share this screen. And again, I'm just gonna mute this. Like I said, sorry for the sort of poor video quality, but here's the very beginning. This is the very beginning to the film uh, Vertigo. So we have these guys coming up the roof, chasing this guy who appears maybe a thief. Um, and as we're watching these shots, because I'll replay this and talk about shots over them, one of the important things that I wanna say is this is a great example of the idea that I mentioned earlier of suspense. This is the very beginning of the film. I have so many questions that are unanswered. Who is this guy that's being chased? Why is he being chased? Are they, going, are they uh, uh, running to catch him, for, to arrest him? Or, or is he, uh, you know, what, what crime has he done? Uh, is this second guy who's falling right now, is he also a police officer because he's not dressed like one or is the other guy the police officer? These are all questions. They're going to be answered in a lot of ways, most of them, if you know the film. Uh, and so suspense happens right away in a Hitchcock film. I start the film with questions. Very famous shots there that maybe you just saw called the vertigo shots where the ground appears to stretch away from the character. Masterpiece. Classic. Absolutely. Okay, here is Vertigo. Now, I'm gonna play this again, and this time I'm gonna talk about some of the shots. Here we talk, we start in an extreme close up, and the camera dollies back. We won't talk too much about camera movement, but if you're interested, that's what it does. Now, here's an important thing. I'm gonna pause this from time to time. This is the first important concept in this clip. These characters all climb up this ladder, and they run right to left, they run to their left, the direction of right to left. Watch, this guy, this is Jimmy Stewart. Pardon me, <clears throat> he will too. Now we're in an extreme long shot or an extreme wide shot and you can see these guys running along the rooftops and they're still running right to left, right to left. Now we're gonna cut to the third shot and they're gonna jump across in the same direction, right to left, and here comes the police officer, he's gonna jump in the same direction, right to left, there he goes. And then comes the third character who's gonna jump across in the same direction, right to left. So this is the concept, this is the first important concept from this clip of screen direction. And this is consistent screen direction. This, these three shots, by having the characters move in the same direction, communicate simple but important information to me. The information that's communicated is that there is a chase and that the position of the characters is not changing and that the guy in white is always at the front and the guy with the hat is always at the back and they're moving in the same direction. Now, let's, as an exercise to better explain that, think of it this way. I'm gonna replay this and I want you to take the middle shot in your mind, I mean, take the middle shot, the extreme wide shot, and imagine just for that shot that the characters run the opposite way. They run left to right, okay? So here, these guys come up, right to left. Oh, sorry, here we go, right to left. Now imagine in this shot, they're running the opposite way. Left to right, just this shot only. Left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right. And then we cut back to this next shot here. And now they're running in this direction, right to left. If that happened, what would happen to the audience? Confused. confused, confused, confused. Good. I'm glad more than one person said it because it's so accurate. We would be watching. We would say, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. What? Like, where are they going? Which which direction are they moving? Why are they going there?" We would. We might think something totally wrong. We might think, "Okay, so since these characters are moving right to left, and these characters are moving left to right, we might think these are two totally separate groups of people." like in the cross cut in The Girl Who Played With Fire, and we might think that they're about to meet, which would be completely, completely wrong. We might think that this rooftop is taking place in another place entirely. It's a whole different chase with characters running in a different direction. We might think that these characters turned some corner, but I never saw it, and I might think, wait, did they, what happened? When did they turn? I missed it. The big point is, 
there would be the word you guys use, confusion. And that's a, the exact opposite of what Hitchcock wants. Hitchcock does not want confusion. He wants dramatic suspense. He wants questions that he is going to slowly unravel. This is Hitchcock's cinema. Screen direction is a bit easier said than done. It would be a cool exercise, actually, because you guys can all do this, for you to take your phone or whatever camera you have available, take one friend, and you can even do it inside, you don't even have to go outside, and get, let's say, four shots of a character walking from one room to the next. And thinking of doing that with consistent screen direction. You'll all be able to do it. You will all be able to do it. It's not that it's so difficult, but for many of you, maybe all of you, there will be at least one of those four shots where you'll think, which side of the camera should she walk to? And, you, and you'll just have to think about it. And again, this is part of the point of film grammar and the director's brain. We need to know, should I be confusing the audience? And am I confusing the audience? And here are another, these two, are another two, another set of important, let me stop my screen share for a moment, I'll come back to Vertigo. Two important director questions. And I ask these all the time in pre-production and on set, and they go together. Am I confusing the audience? Question one. Question two, should I be confusing the audience? Am I confusing? If the answer is yes, then should I be? The, if the answer better be yes. Am I confusing the audience? If you say yes, and should I be, and you say no, then you are doing something incorrect. Let me give you an example. I'll make one up, right? So let's say that you're shooting a scene and there are 10 people at a protest. Maybe it's bigger, but let's just say 10. And everyone's holding signs and yelling and it's, a, and it's outside. And let's say that uh, the police come and they shoot uh, smoke bombs. You've probably either seen this in, in some way or, or hopefully none of you have experienced this, but they shoot smoke bombs into the crowd, okay? And there's confusion, right? Everyone runs in different directions. No one can see where they're going. Everyone breaks apart and runs. As a director making that scene, I probably want no confusion for the audience in terms of who is where before the smoke bombs are shot, but after the smoke bombs are shot, maybe confusion is a good thing. Because everyone's everywhere and the chaos doesn't matter at that point, the point is chaos. Can you guys see what I'm saying? But I would only be able to identify if I'm doing a good job if I ask myself those really simple questions. Is the audience confused? Should the audience be confused? Very important questions for a director to know. Let's keep going with a little more vertigo so I can hit some other important parts. I wanna go up to points of view and I will get it in a moment. Uh, before I do that, let me ask you guys, before I show you, what's point of view? Sometimes just called POV. What is a point of view in film? Uh, yeah, where the camera ahead. imitates the, the view of the character. Great, yeah, great answer, great answer. So where the camera imitates the view of the character. So you guys all saw me do this as my camera earlier. So maybe this is my point of view, right? The camera is my eyes, yeah? And we see this a lot. In traditional filmmaking, and remember, we gotta learn the rules to break them. So here's a rule that maybe some of you will keep with and maybe some of you will break. In traditional filmmaking, a point of view is actually three shots. And it is, I'll tell you the first two and see if someone can give me the third one. And then I'll show you them. Shot number one, a shot of a character looking. Shot number two, what Kevin just said, a shot of a character looking, uh, I'm sorry, the camera as the character's eyes. So shot number one, Neil looks. Shot number two, what Neil looks at. What is shot number three? Over the shoulder of the... Uh, it could be. It could be. It's not the exact answer, but it could be an answer. What's shot number three? The situation, the situation of the character. Hmm? Yeah, I think that's pretty close. I think that's pretty close. Shot number three is, is specifically the character's reaction. reaction. What, what the person sees, what that means to the person. 
So watch, I will play you Vertigo again, and let's see a couple point of views. I'm gonna do this quickly, because it happens quickly, and then I'll come back and show you again. So, they start very soon. Watch. Character looks here, character looks, what he looks at. He reacts, he looks, what he looks at. He reacts. He, here comes, looks, nope, not there. Here it comes, looks, what he looks at. He reacts. He looks, what he looks at. He reacts. Point of view shots. Three shot sequence is the traditional point of view. And it, it is this way because all three of those shots are designed to give me information. The shot of the character looking tells me who. The shot, of, the shot through the character's eyes tells me what. And the shot of the character's emotion is, uh, of reaction is the emotional climax of the three shot sequence. If you remove one of these shots, maybe you have confusion. And then it is up to you to determine, is it confusion that you want or confusion that you do not want? Just like I asked you guys to remember to ask yourselves a moment ago. If you remove the first shot, we might not know right away who is looking. It might only be a split second of confusion. Still, is that confusion that you want? If you remove the middle shot, what they look at, we might have to guess by the third shot, the reaction, as to what they saw. Is that confusion that you want? If we remove the third shot, their reaction, we might be confused as to what what they saw means to them. Is this confusion that you want? It's up to you to determine it. I'm not saying that one is right or not. These are a case by case, a film by film basis. But if you know these ideas, then you know to ask these questions, then you know how to make these decisions. Let's keep going, but as always, interrupt away, please, if things come up. Who is the main character in this scene? Which character? You have three characters. And let's just go back to the beginning so you can see these three. Here's character one. And here comes character two. We'll just call them one, two, and three. And here comes character three. Who is the main character in this scene? Three, one. The third, the third character. Got one, one, and a couple threes. How, those of you that said three, how do you know that it's three? If you haven't seen the film. <laughs> because we saw the, the reaction. Good answer, good answer. He gets more reactions than anyone else in the scene. Reaction shots are, are human emotion shots. We are all human, right? So who can we relate to most? Human reactions. So because he gets the most reaction shots, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why I know that he is, and it is true, he is the most important character in the scene. How else do you know that he is the most important character in the scene? How else? I'll move on. Oh, sorry. He didn't die Go. easily. <laughs> yeah, good answer. He, do he doesn't die. I mean, uh, maybe this would be a flashback structure, and so he would die and we would go back, which, of course, we've seen now. But uh, what is Vertigo? 1958, I think? 56, 58? Sunset That's not happening then. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. What year? Sunset Boulevard. Say it again? Sunset, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so it, it does happen. Uh, but it's, it's a good answer nonetheless. So he doesn't die, we get the most reactions from him. Maybe better to say we get the most emotion from him. How else do we know that he's the most important character? He is the priority because his friend has him. Okay, okay, good, good. So let's say it, it's a great answer. Let's say it in not, not a better way, but just another way. So we could say it in two different ways. You said he's a priority because his friend helped him. I love this answer. It's also that he is the source of drama. So it seems like the guy in white, the first guy, is going to be the source of drama. But this guy is long forgot. Actually, the source of drama of the scene is not about catching a thief. It's about survival and a fear of heights, if you, if you know where the film will go. So good. He's the priority. He is the source of drama. I'll just show you two other simple ways. And these are, are simple but not simple. One, I don't have to show you. I can just tell you. We see him the most. This doesn't mean he's the most important character by itself but it could contribute. 
And here's another reason. Most of the cuts, meaning when we move from shot to shot, are, are, uh, revolve around him. So watch what I mean. We don't cut when that guy almost falls, but when this next character, here we cut, and here we'll cut again, and here we'll cut again. So we are getting most of the cuts related to that character. One of, uh, I'm saying one of, yet another major question that we have to ask ourselves as directors, and we do it for every single scene we have ever and will ever in your life direct, is whose scene is it? And you guys, if you haven't heard that before, you will hear that a lot. Whose scene is it? Whose scene is it means simply who is the most important character in the film? In a more complex way, it might mean who is the source of emotion or drama in the, in the film, in the scene. I'm saying in the film, in the scene. Sometimes that's kind of simple. In this scene in Vertigo, it has to be Jimmy Stewart playing Scotty, the guy falling. Because this character, who's running away in the background, never returns. And this character dies. So it must be the other guy. But in some scenes, it can be really complicated. For example, I'm just trying to think of a very famous film. Think of The Godfather. Hopefully many of you have seen The Godfather. If you haven't, go watch The Godfather after this class. It's great. In The Godfather, there are many scenes where two incredibly famous actors and really important characters, Al Pacino and Marlon Brando, are in scenes together. How do you decide whose scene it is? We as directors have to go through the script, think in rehearsal, and decide, okay, who is more important for the purposes of the story that I want to tell as one way to make this decision? We can get more into that later, but the point that I want to make here is that Alfred Hitchcock made the pretty easy determination that it is Jimmy Stewart, the man hanging down, it is his scene. And so for all the reasons that you guys and I said, we can tell that. Now, just imagine something different. Imagine if right at this moment, this exact moment in the scene where I'm paused, Hitchcock made a different cut. So right now, I'm gonna play it and then I'll go back to this shot. Right now, he cuts from this image that you see to this image, because this guy's really important. But imagine inste if instead of cutting from here to Jimmy Stewart's close-up, imagine if we cut to this guy. Can you guys see my mouse? Imagine if you cut to this guy's close-up, right? And imagine if in that close-up, he turned around and looked back. And then imagine if we went into a point of view sequence using this character, this thief. So we got a close-up. He turns around and looks back over his shoulder as he runs away. We get a shot of this character's back, what the thief's eyes see. And then we see the thief's reaction as he runs away safely, having escaped the police. I bet that all of us, all of us, would have at least something like the same thought, which is that character's important and he's going to come back. I bet all of us would. And it's not because he says something. It's not because he performs a different crime or does anything. It's because of the film grammar and because the source of emotion would change. For a moment, we would move closer to him and we would see his emotional reaction and therefore I would feel emotionally closer to him. This would have been a mistake. Hitchcock didn't do it because Hitchcock was a great director. This would have been a mistake. It would have been the wrong kind of confusion in a way. I would have thought maybe later in the film, 45 minutes later, I would have thought, hmm, I wonder when that guy's gonna come back. He had, you know, he had that moment on the roof. I haven't seen him again. Hitchcock doesn't do it because this guy doesn't ever come back in the movie. He's not the source of drama or tension in this scene. I have a question. Okay. Please. Um, if I'm not mistaken <clears throat> usually the main character is um on the first shot right Sometimes, so yeah, uh, i mean I, i'm kind of confused about this that um why alfred hitchcock uses um the white um suits because uh the viewer's eyes directly goes through to that right so Good. is that, do, do you know is there is there a reason why he yep. wears a white suit it's a, it's a great question, and it's kind of a two-part question, right? It's on one hand, 
why isn't the main character the first one up, the first one we see? And secondly, why would you put the least important character in the brightest, most noticeable color, white? Let's, let's bring that image up. I love this question. Um, and then maybe we can all answer this, or some of us can give an answer. So let's find this image, and let's just bring this guy up. So it's not our main character's hands. And I love, the, I love the, the question also because you're, you're focusing on the mise-en-scene as well, the fact that he's wearing white. This was a conscious decision by Hitchcock. Hitchcock did not say, I just put him in some clothes. Anything, anything will do. Hitchcock probably went through a bunch of different wardrobe options and eventually said, yeah, that's what he's going to wear. And it was this very noticeable, recognizable white. So there's the image. I'm going to stop my screen share so I can see you all. Anyone have any ideas? For this answer, why not show our main character first, and why dress the least important character in the most recognizable wardrobe? By the way, I have a guess, but it's only a guess. I didn't get to talk to Hitchcock. I wish I did. Is it to manipulate the audience? How do How do you mean? I like this answer. How do you mean? Uh, I mean, just like you mentioned earlier about Godfather, when the first shot is Marlon Brando, I we thought that. The God, uh, almost uh, uh, obviously the Godfather is Marlon Brando, but but mm -hmm. the stories about Michael Corleone, right? It's the yeah. same story about mm -hmm. the Vertigo. We thought we thought mm -hmm. we we're gonna rooting for the thief. That mm -hmm. I don't know that yeah. kind of story, and then mm -hmm. the policeman fell down. It's quite quite a good answer. Quite a good answer. Uh, and the white shirt, and the white shirt is for the contrast between the night, the dark night, and then mm -hmm. yeah. Good. I like these answers quite a bit. I like this idea, especially of manipulation, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, may maybe it's just suspense on a small scale. If suspense is, and you don't have to believe my definition, but for me, I like the definition of an unanswered question that is awaiting an answer. And, and, uh, and if suspense is this, then I have multiple points of suspense right away. Whose hands are these? Who is this guy? Why is this guy running? I have suspense. I've, that's three questions in three seconds in the beginning of this movie. Now, I, I don't think as a viewer I consciously ask them, but they're buried somewhere in my brain. It's part of the fun of watching this movie, right? Like, why? Ah, that's why. Who? Ah, okay, that, that's who. Ah, okay, I'm getting it. This is part of the point. And so maybe this is small-scale suspense right at the beginning. Manipulation. I think it's a good answer. As opposed to just giving me the hero right away, maybe I have to do a little work to figure it out. Maybe I have to wait until the jump to decide to find out not only is that guy not the main character, but also the scene has nothing to do with him. Yeah, it's quite a good answer. I like also the secondary answer about the white outfit being a contrast. I'm sure some of you are thinking about some form of symbolism. Heroes are often wearing white and, and maybe that works its way in here somewhere. There's, there's many famous examples of that, for example, in, in Psycho. Um, when characters wear white or, or black clothing in that film. And it, it could be, I don't want to dismiss that as a possibility. Um, but it could also just be that this is our first image, and so this guy is thrown at us, both in his visual identity and in his having the first appearance of the film. And then our expectations are thwarted or changed as the film progresses. Cool. Good question. Good answer. Uh, okay, let me try to get to a couple more things while we still have time. The, uh, the beautiful thing and the, and the frustrating thing about directing is there's so much to talk about. How much time do I still have, Giovanni? With, uh, 15 minutes. <coughs> but, 15 minutes. But, but I could give you like 20, 20, 25 minutes. Is okay. Super. Five cool. Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's... Let's use fun, that. Fun, but, uh, What's that? It's What's that? Fun. It's, it's, it's fun. I don't want to stop yeah. you. So. For me too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's use this time to talk a little bit about an important concept that some of you might know, and then I'll make it into something um, more visual. Uh, this is called the 180 line, the axis, the action line. These are all the same thing. Uh, some of you, I can see by your faces, some of you have heard this or know what it is, uh, but it's hard to define. Um, and of course, as we've been doing today, I think we'll define it and then move into more useful applications of it. 
who, who wants to take a crack at it? What's the 180 line? Or the 180 degree line? The rules when you have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good. So with two or more people, the one, I'm gonna call it the 180 line. But again, it could be called the 180 degree line, the line, the axis, the action line, the 180. These are all the same thing. So it occurs with, one or, uh, with two or more people. Any other ideas? Even if they're broad or guesses, it's fine. Uh, it's like when we watch uh, an opera and then we can't go, we can't see through the back of the stage. Uh, when we see an opera, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, uh, we can see the opera from the back. It's mm -hmm. blocked by the stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's using the, from, yeah, yeah. No, no, cool. Using, I've not, I have not thought of it this way, but using the curtain as an example is quite interesting. I like it. Good starts. These are good. Let, let me do uh, a quick explanation, but then it's going to be better for us to watch some things. So <clears throat> let's imagine, if you can, that uh, Giovanni and I are in the same room, okay? And, and you guys can all imagine that he and I are sitting across the table from each other. And so when Giovanni and I, in this fictional scene that I'm talking about now, look at each other, when we look across the table at each other, so Giovanni's on the other side of my, arm, my hand here. This hand is Giovanni. This hand is the 180 line. When we look at one another, an imaginary line is created. It's imaginary. Of course, we can't see it. What this rule tells us, rule tells us, is that the camera during the conversation between Giovanni and I should always be on one side of this line. So I'm going to talk in much more detail about this, but if this is, if even that is super confusing, then think about it in your own room where you are now. Imagine someone is sitting across from you and imagine you look at that person and the, the point of your eyes meeting their eyes, that is the line. And the rule again says, now there is a horizontal line between these two characters. When I want to shoot the scene from four different angles, I should choose to be all on this 180 degree side, or here's the line, this 180 degree side. That's what the rule says. Of course, that doesn't explain why, which we're gonna do in a moment. Let me, I'm not sure, how, let's see how much this helps um, before I bring up some clips. Uh, let me just find this file. Here's just a, a, another way to visualize this, um, this image. Are we so, Tar are we Tarantino's clip? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Tar but Tarantino can get very tricky because he just moves, <laughs> he moves so much. <laughs> so let's, use this. Now this is going to look very simple, but when I bring up clips to support it, I hope that it will become clearer. So here is a really simple idea of the 180 line. These are two characters who are looking at each other. This is like my example of Giovanni and I. This dotted line is the 180, 180 degree line. It is these two people making eye contact with each other. So, director and DOP have two decisions, two options. Pardon me. They can put their camera on this side. This is why it's called 180, 180 degrees, this side of the line, or this side of the line. In this really simple diagram, if the director puts the camera here for maybe an over the shoulder shot on this character, and then puts the character here, for an over the shoulder shot on this character, and then puts the camera here for a profile two shot, hopefully this film grammar is making sense, then nothing will be confusing. And confusion is the key here. We want to avoid it with the 180 degree line. But if the, car if the DOP and director put the camera on the opposite side of the line, something will appear to be confusing. Now, this diagram, I can email this to uh, you, Giovanni, or anyone if, if, if it's helpful for you guys to have. Um, this diagram, hopefully, is a further explanation of what the line looks like, but we still haven't talked about what it does. Let's do that. 
Let's go back to Vertigo, and then I'll go to a new clip. And I've actually never tried to do this when not in a classroom with people. So let's see how successful we are. I think we'll be okay. I'm gonna use a few shots here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Okay, let's imagine we have three shots. Here is the first shot. This is a maybe a wide shot, or you might call it a full shot. Now you can imagine, as I move forward, we are, all know what happens in this clip, that for this character, this is Jimmy Stewart, for him to look at the policeman, he must look to the left. You guys can all see that? He has to look to the left. For the policeman who's up here, when he looks down at Jimmy Stewart, he must look to the right of the frame. If anyone needs me to repeat any of this, because this, this can be a difficult concept, please let me know. This is the important thing to know here. Someone used the term establishing shot earlier. This shot right here establishes where, rooftop. It establishes when, night. But it's also establishing the side of the 180 degree line. And so by doing, and, and by doing so, it's, it's establishing that Jimmy Stewart must look left to look to the police officer. The police officer must look right to look at Jimmy Stewart. Now I'll keep playing it. Notice how we are on the same side of the roof or the 180 degree line. If Jimmy Stewart wanted to look up to the police officer, he would look up and to the right, or to the left, I'm sorry, to the left. I'll keep going. Now we know, even though the police officer is not in the shot, he's not there, we all know who this guy is looking to. And the reason we know this right now is because that establishing shot established that when Jimmy Stewart is looking to the police officer, he will look up and to the left. That shot gave me that information. Now, here comes the really tricky part of this. And I'll tell you it in another way in a second. Imagine if the camera, instead of facing the left side of Jimmy Stewart's face, imagine if the camera is down over here and it's facing the right side of Jimmy Stewart's face. You guys can all see that in your brain? That camera would be on the opposite side of the 180 degree line. And it would appear that Jimmy Stewart, instead of looking to the left, were looking to the right. He wouldn't move. He would be in the same position in space. But the position of the camera relative to his body would make it appear that he were looking in the wrong direction. That would be a 180 degree line break. And I'm going to show you one of those. But even more simply, imagine if you took your camera, and you guys can all do this at home, and I recommend you do. And if you have a roommate or live with someone, even better. If you live with someone, what you should do after this class, the first thing you should do after this class, is sit across from each other. So if it were me, we would, I would sit across from someone, and I would look at that person, and I would take a photo of my face on the right side of my face, so on this side of the 180 degree line, and then I would just turn my camera around, and take a photo of my friend, and it would be on the left side of their face because they would be facing me. And then I would take a photo of one of the two of us on the opposite side of our face, going over the 180 degree line. And I would look at those three photos on my phone, and you would be able to tell, you will be able to tell that the third photo, the one that's the opposite side of the face, makes it appear as though the two of you are looking in the same direction rather than at each other. This is a super confusing concept if you've never heard of it. Super confusing. Let me walk back through this and then let me show you an example where a filmmaker intentionally makes this mistake so you can see it. But just to talk it through again because I think, I'm guessing a lot of you haven't done this before. This shot establishes the 180 degree line. Here, even though Jimmy Stewart's not in the shot, 
If the police officer were to turn around and look at him, he would be looking right. Jimmy Stewart would be looking left. Alfred Hitchcock sees, you can see where my mouse is, that this is the line. It's established by two characters looking at each other. It's right there. He has picked the side that we are currently on here as his side of the line of the 180. So now for the rest of the scene, for Jimmy Stewart to look at the police officer, he must look up and to the left. And for the police officer to look down at Jimmy Stewart, he must look down and to the right. And exactly the mo motion Giovanni just did. And if, if you as a director were after taking this wide shot to try to shoot your close-ups on the other side of the, of the 180 degree line, these two characters would appear to be looking the opposite way. And the police officer, instead of looking down and to the right, it would look like he was looking down and to the left, almost at that criminal. And Jimmy Stewart, instead of appearing to look up and to the left at the police officer, it would look like he were looking up to the right, like at the sky. It would be confusing. The 180 line, I'm gonna stop my screen share, is a complex, complex concept. Once you get the hang of it, it becomes quite simple. But the, while we have time, what I want to do is show you one, at least one clip where it's broken, and then maybe if I can squeeze it in, I'm gonna show you one more clip where it's changed. That's so funny. I've been waiting please. for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So here is my clip, and I'm gonna do this relatively quickly, just so I can get, because I wanna get two clips in, because they'll be helpful uh, more so than one. This is a clip from Akira Kurosawa's very famous film, The Idiot, based on Dostoevsky's novel. It's an amazing film. And I will, I don't have subtitles, but I'm also not going to play it with sound. I only want to focus on the 180 degree line here. Nothing else about this. So, oops, sorry. Here we go. Here is the scene. Here is, the, here is the wide shot, also the establishing shot. It establishes where uh, we can kind of tell that it's night, but what it's really going to do for our purposes is establish the axis or the 180 degree line. Look at this man in the foreground frame left and this woman who is standing in the background frame right. Because of this wide shot, just like in Vertigo, the 180 degree line has been established. You guys can all see the exact same thing that I can. If she wants to look at him, she must look to the left and he must look to the right. Everyone can see that here. She must look left, he must look right. Like Hitchcock, Kurosawa is now going to cut to closer shots. But he is going to do something different than Hitchcock. So watch, and I will play this a few times. Just remember for now, she must look left, he must look right. Oh, gotta find my controls. Here we go. So now we will get, he will stand. And we'll get an insert shot of the chair falling. Now he looks left. Remember, he was supposed to look right. And she looks left. They both look left. Can you guys see what I'm talking about? See how he's looking to the left, she's looking to the left. They're both looking to the left. Let me go back. I know, that, again, that this can be confusing. Here it is from the wide shot, the establishing shot. He should look right. He should look right. He should look right. Remember that. He should look right. His shot is the one that's broken. He looks left. Kurosawa has gone to the other side of this imaginary 180-degree line. The line is between their gaze. He has moved on to the other side of the table. Here is another way that might be helpful for some of you to think of the 180 degree line. Think about shoulders. His, the, the camera right now shows his right shoulder and the camera right now shows her left shoulder. And because the line, the 180 line is between their eyes and because we are already on this side, if we see, if we are closer to one of their shoulders, it should always remain the same two shoulders, his right shoulder, her left shoulder. Because if I go closer to her, let her right shoulder, I will have jumped to the other side of the line. Now, when I hit play, 
I am over her right shoulder, her incorrect shoulder, the other side of the axis. It's a momentary moment of confusion. Wait, why is this guy looking left? Why is he looking left? In the wide shot, he was looking right. Who is he looking at? I have a quick moment where I'm not sure what's happening. Kurosawa does this intentionally. We don't have time to get too deep into it, but what he wants in this moment is for us to be confused because the characters in the scene are confused. It's a critical scene in the film where everyone sitting at the table thinks, whoa, wait, what just happened? That's the emotion of the characters. And maybe on a small scale, very small scale, we also have that feeling. Wait, what just happened? So he uses the technique of the 180 degree line. He breaks the line in order to match the emotion that the other characters are feeling. In Vertigo, Alfred Hitchcock never breaks the line. In The Idiot, Kurosawa breaks the line. He puts the camera for one shot on the other side of the axis. Now, maybe this is still super confusing. Luckily for you guys, I have one more clip to show you. Yeah. Giovanni, just stop me, Giovanni, when I'm not good. I'm assuming I have about five more minutes. No, we, so. we have five, so it's okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, one more clip, which, I, again, my whole point here is the 180, and to give you guys a deeper understanding of it. So, this is from Jean-Pierre Genet's film, A Very Long Engagement. Uh, and some of you might know Jean-Pierre Genet. Uh, he's probably most famous for the film Amelie. Yeah. Uh, and so, as usual, no subtitles, hard to get them embedded, but I'm just finding my clip. Okay, here's my clip. So, this is a beautiful scene. The, the, the mise-en-scene is amazing. So, here is the beginning of this clip. Before I hit play and talk about the 180 degree line, I wanna make one point that I promised I would come back to. Someone mentioned at the beginning of class that an establishing shot establishes character's movement. This here that we are looking at, and I will hit play in a moment, is an establishing shot. It shows me where and when. And it will show me one character's movement, this guy. But there's another character that you will all see in a moment, and this shot does not show me her movement. So if you remember at the very beginning of when we started talking, I said, establishing shots do not always show characters' movement. Here's an example. We only see one of two characters' movements in the establishing shot, just to go back to that. But now, let's continue on for the 180 degree line. And we're gonna look at it in a brand new way. Again, this is a really gorgeous, very stylistic scene. So the camera moves in. I'm not going to, again, talk too much about camera movement. And we can see two characters now. And we know, I'm going to talk about this in the same way for now, that he looks to the right when he looks at her. He looks to the right. If he were to raise his gun, he would point it right and point it to her. And she looks to the left when she looks at him. He looks right. She looks left. Right now, the camera is moving. And now the opposite is true. He now looks left. She now looks right. I'm gonna play this again, but the camera has now shifted the position of the 180 degree line. Let's watch this again. Before I hit play, think about Hitchcock. He showed us that wide, medium wide establishing shot where the men jumped across the roof. He was saying, this is the side of the 180 degree line I'm on. When he went to his two shot, his close-ups on both guys, he stayed on that side. We were never confused. When we watched Kurosawa, he did the same thing at first. He showed us a wide. The man should look right. The woman should look left. But when he cut to the man, he went to the other side of the axis. And we had a momentary moment that something's a little weird. We weren't utterly confused, but something felt strange. Here is a different technique. Jeunet, the director, at this moment, right here, has chosen this side, this side, this side of the axis. You can all see where my mouse is, right? Here is one side, because this is their gaze, and over here would be the other side of the axis. She looks left, he looks right. She looks left, he looks right. When he cuts, when the director cuts to this medium close-up, and tilts down 
to the hand, the man still looks right. He still looks right. She still looks left in order to make eye contact with him. Right now, right now, we are on the line. This is the line. We're on it. And if you remember, the man must look right to look at her. The woman must look left to look at him. Now the opposite is true. He looks left where before he looked right. She looks right where before she looked left. In the first example, Alfred Hitchcock, I'm gonna, I'll come back to this clip in a moment. Alfred Hitchcock's goal was no confusion at all. He was going to show us drama using the ways we discussed, point of view, various shots of the man almost falling. In The Idiot, the Kurosawa film, he wants us to feel something at a really specific moment. He breaks the 180 degree line at a very precise point in his film. So we feel something. Not everyone's gonna feel that. Some people might watch that scene and not think twice, but some people will watch that and think, Wait, what? And then they'll go on with the scene. In Jean-Pierre Jeunet's scene, he wants us to feel a change. As the camera moves behind the woman, something shifts. For me, this is a change in power. When Junet changes, he doesn't break. Kurosawa breaks the 180 line. Junet changes the line. When Junet changes the line, at the same time, I start to think, what's up with this woman? Why isn't she running away? That guy's got a gun. Why isn't she scared? The power of the scene shifts. He goes from having full control, powerful guy walking towards helpless woman holding a gun, to, uh, wait a minute, something's up. And the 180 degree line happens at the same time. This is the beauty of technique like this. It's not just doing it because it looks cool. I mean, don't get me wrong, that scene from a very long engagement looks cool. But it's doing it for a reason. It's doing it for a dramatic reason. I told you at the beginning of this class that my priorities are performance and, and story. And this technique is a story technique. The 180 degree line shift is because there is a shift in the story, in the power of the two characters. I'm gonna go back to the clip and just play you the end to show you what I mean. Let's just go back so we can see that 180 degree line change one last time. There it is. That's called a track. The camera tracks behind the woman to change the axis, the line, the 180. And here, as I said, there's a shift in power starting to happen. Look at their reactions. I love the performance. She's calm and cool. She has glasses covering her eyes. Look at him. What's going on with this woman? He doesn't quite know why she's not running away scared. And it's because she's got something hidden that he doesn't know about. She has a hidden gun. She takes full power of the scene. Great end of the scene, right? Yeah, it's awesome. But the important thing is understanding what the technique is. We need to understand what the rules are to talk about the rules. We need to understand what the rules are to break the rules. But as important, maybe more important, at least once you get a, a grasp on the, basis, on the basics, why do we do stuff like this? Genet thought in pre-production, I can guarantee you in pre-production that this director, he thought, this is a critical moment for this female character. This is a really important shift in her character. This is a change. This is a beat. I told you I'd use that word a lot too. How do I show that? I can do it through the performances. I can do it through the, the lighting, the mise-en-scene. Here's another way I can do it. Jeunet probably thought something like this. All three of these directors have their reasons for doing what they're doing. Not breaking the line, breaking the line, changing the line. Okay. Guys, I think uh, maybe, maybe that's all we got. I've got like 20 more clips, but I feel like we don't have time for those. But uh, I just, uh, but, before yeah. we... Unfortunately. But no, it's... Uh, uh, well, please, Giovanni. I will give a chance to somebody to ask like one question. Is sure. that okay, Neil? Uh, that's, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, if there are any follow-up questions at the end, please, uh, please go for it. I know we ended on kind of a tricky concept. Hopefully it made yeah. sense. For me, it's a, it's a fun way. Yeah. Uh, to think about filmmaking. Is there anybody questions? Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to ask about uh, where the scene in in the Kurosawa film where many people sit on the table, uh, and I find it's very it's very difficult to direct this kind of scene because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there are so there are so many so many people <laughs> in the scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I... Uh, Go ahead. Where? Yes. That's my question. How how to you know, to sure. to manage? <coughs> I, I, think I also many... added one question later. Is please, it please, okay? Please. Yeah, Ask please. you. Uh, it's it's okay for me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> for you, Neil. I mean, it's up to Neil. So yeah, it's okay. Like, so you can so, yeah, answer the question. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Gonna... So first, Kevin, and you go. And then yeah. maybe one one question. One me me question. me. I'll let I'll let you decide who's next. I'll I'll let, yeah. You just, you just you just tell me when, Johan. Okay. So uh, so, so let, let, why don't I why don't I answer Kevin's question and then and then if there are others. Yeah, Kevin Kevin cool. course. Yeah. yeah, I I think it's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, there are many answers. Some of them are kind of boring answers, but I think they're important. One of the boring answers is that on a shoot, you, you guys should all at some point, whether now or in the future, have a very good assistant director. And one of the many jobs of an assistant director, an AD, is to help you with the extras, the other people who are, who are not the main characters in the scene. And a good AD is not only someone you trust, but a good AD also, in my opinion, has a, has a good visual sense, strong visual background. And so sometimes, if it's a, if it's a scene with many people, the AD might actually be in charge of many of the extras while you, the director, handle the main performances. I think this is one of the kind of, as I said, more boring answers. Maybe a better answer though, uh, and, and maybe you guys are already thinking of this, is, is simply is two forms of rehearsal. I like rehearsal, but I don't like to rehearse too much because I want to reserve some of the energy for the actual shoot. I'm afraid of over-rehearsing. But in a, in a crowd scene, I might do two kinds of rehearsal. I don't have probably the time or the money to bring all of the people in for a rehearsal. So what I might do is first rehearse the scene with the, with the principal characters, and they would just pretend there are other people. And then I could just run the scene and have the other extra actors react off of the main characters. You will hear this term again in your life. Acting is reacting. And a lot of times, actor's main job is simply to react to who is in charge of the scene. But as an opposite approach, and I'll give you one more example of this, you might, you might do the reverse. And you might not rehearse with your main actors too much. And instead, figure things out with the lesser actors, the extra actors, and therefore force your main actors to react to your extra actors, which could be exciting for them. They, they might come into an unknown space and not know where everyone's going to sit and who's going to stand up when, and the reactions might be purer, might be more truthful. In, in, in the very great, I think, uh, French film from 2009, A Prophet, um, by Jacques Audiard. It's a great film. Yeah, it's, a, it's set in a prison. And the director, Audiard, said that he uh, didn't bring his main actors into the prison. He brought all the prison extras in and he organized and arranged their movement. And then when they were shooting, he brought the main actors in. And the actors were really tense. You know, is someone going to come up behind me? Who, who can I trust in this space? He got his, his performance with a, mass, uh, a large group of people in that way. So three different ways to think about it. I love the question. Okay, thank you. Sure. Next, next two questions. Hey, go ahead, please. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, when, you, uh, when you tell us about the girl who played with fire, uh, yeah. the one that clip. You said yeah. uh, something about believable. That the the car uh, when I think Euro or someone uh, said that if she fell off this ladder, mm -hmm. it won't believable because uh, her character is strong and independent and some Could kind be. of. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of screenwriting, uh, yeah. uh, how we write uh, uh, the character that uh, will and and their action to make it believable. I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. It's the yes. character have to be a rich or something, a, a, yeah. a rich characteristic, or I don't know what. How how you do that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think I think there are many ways to write. Of course, there are many. Usually, when I write a character, my first draft of a character is very bad, and and the character is rather boring, and I haven't quite figured out all of their traits or personalities. I haven't figured out what they do, what they cannot do. But I just want to write something and put words down on paper because staring at a blank screen is terrible. And so I do that for the first draft. And then I go back and I take my characters and I write a little bit of backstory for them. I write two pages about who they are. And this information might never come into the script. I write where they grew up. Did they have brothers, sisters? Are they... Uh, educated, uneducated? Are they from a certain class? Did they do specific jobs? Have they traveled? I just write stuff. Most of that never makes it into the script, but it informs me as to who the person is. I can, I can see them. They become a clearer person. And when I've written that and I go into my second draft, now I can start thinking, okay, this character would not do this. Or this character used to work in a bank. And so they're probably good with numbers. So in this scene, which involves numbers, they might actually be able to do that. And because I have this background that I've written, it's consistent and I'm not guessing each time. It's like I have an autobiography and I'm pulling facts. So this is probably my major technique for doing this. The last thing I do, which I strongly recommend any screenwriter and director, is as much as I can, I have people who have never read the script, read scenes out loud for me to hear. Because when you read things in your own voice to yourself, we change things, little things, to make them believable. Or we ignore things, or we don't hear them. But when someone reads it fresh, and someone reads it who doesn't have the same attachment as you do, and you can sit back and listen, you'll hear all the problems, <laughs> and, 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 but it's a good exercise. It's a very good exercise. Yeah, These are probably the three steps in order that I do. Thank you, Neil. Of course, thanks for the question. Okay, last question, guys. Uh, Who? Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, okay uh, uh, so Neil, uh, I'm really new about the 100, 180 degrees rules or uh, yeah that one uh, I'm just curious uh, about the changing or breaking the rules uh, sure. uh, is it uh, okay to ask for really breaking the rules for example I don't know uh, I, I know this uh, Korean de- one this Korean director named Hong Sang Soo mm-hmm. instead of using cutscenes he used uh, zoom zoom into the character and then zoom out again zoom in and then yeah so like that uh i find it more effective and more uh haunting (laughs) in in a good way so uh i'm just curious is it uh still in the 180 degree rules or breaking the rules uh is is it really important the 180 degrees thank you yeah that's a great question I, I bet that Hong Sang Soo knows the 180 rule. I, I bet he does. I can almost guarantee you he does. Uh, <laughs> yes. But, but Hong Sang Soo discovered his style, and, and that was not in his style. Um, I, I read this great, or maybe I watched this great interview with Ruben Ostlund, the, uh, the, the, the really great uh, yes. Swedish director. You know, maybe you know Force Majeure or... Uh, play or, or the square. Uh, he's, he's a great director. Or, um, the, on the, yeah. Uh, square, the square, yeah. The square, the square yeah, exactly. And Ostland shoots in a, in a similar style to Hong Sang Soo in that he zooms a lot and does not cut much. And I read this interview with him where he was talking about making a, a short film as a student. And the sh- I'll, I'll tell the short version. He's setting up for this uh, really difficult shot. And he and his crew have taken all day to set up for this shot. And uh, so they've taken about eight hours and they have still not taken the shot. They're just setting up. And about eight hours in, he realizes, I don't actually want this shot. And he is very afraid 
that his whole crew will say, oh, what, what did you make us do? We've worked so hard. And so he says, he talks about how he was, was not sure that he would say anything. And he's thinking, maybe I'll just take the shot. I don't have to use it. But then he convinced himself, no, you're the director and you're not being a jerk if you go up and you make a decision. And so he went up and he said to everyone, guys, I'm really sorry. This isn't the shot I want. I know we spent eight hours setting it up, but I'm not going to use it in the edit anyway. So let's break it all down and set up something else. And he said that his whole crew said, we really like that you know what you want. And no one was angry at him. And I bring that story up in relation to your question, because Ostland had this idea of style. And he had the style that he really wanted over here. And then I think the style that he thought he should do. So in your example, it's Hung Sung Su and the 180 degree line. And Ostland made the decision of his style and his vision, his truthfulness, his, his believability, his drama. He made that decision. I think it's a great decision that he made. I love his films. I think all of these directors have a few advantages over you and, and their advantages that you will come to. They've been doing this for longer. They've made more films. They probably made films where they looked back and said, eh, I don't love that style. That's not a style I'm gonna follow anymore. I bet, I haven't seen Hong Sung Soo's early shorts, but I bet there are some that exist, maybe he doesn't show them to anyone, that don't look like his films. And he had to come to that style. But I think he probably came there in, this, in similar ways that Ostland did. Let me try something. Okay, I figured out that this doesn't work for me. It might be perfect to the group rules and the grammar, but it's not truthful to me. Another definition of truthfulness for you guys. And so then he probably settled on what is his style. It's one of the beauties of filmmaking, right? It's an art. It's subjective. I'm here to talk about my perspective, but my perspective is not the rule. So uh, as a director, it's okay to find our own style. It, uh, of course. Even though it's, uh, it, broke, it breaks the rules. Of course, of course. Is it, is it dramatic? Is it believable? Is, are the performances to, to where you want them to be? Are you eliciting emotion from your audience? Do you like it? Those questions are in the, in the end of directing. We're at the beginning here. At the end of directing, those questions are far more important. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Great uh, question. Uh, okay, now it looks like <laughs> one more question. <laughs> one more, one more is okay. okay. One more, last, right, guys? Sure, sure. Euro, go ahead. Well, uh, I want to ask, ask the director. Can you hear my voice clearly? I ca yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, as a director, is we direct the people's mind on the film or just let them think on their self? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you mean do you mean with the audience or with the actors? No, no, the audience. The audience. We direct yep. their yep. mind. Yes. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, every director is going to ask, answer this question differently. Uh, for me, uh, I, I think at certain points in my career, I have directed for an audience. And I've never been happy with those films. Uh, I don't, at this point in my career, I don't know what it means to direct to an audience. The audience is so huge. I don't, I don't, know, how to, I don't know how to put all of those people in one thing. <laughs> And, and, and so at a certain point in my life, I stopped doing that and I decided that I'll make things that matter to me, that I really love, that I really care about, and that will stick with me because there've gotta be some people like me out there. <laughs> and so, and so uh, I think uh, this is like, if you do it, you will find them. You know, I think that's how many people must believe in film. Um, I'm not searching for an audience and I'm not searching to guide the audience, in, which I think is part of your question, guiding the audience. Mm. Um, but I am making films in the way that I love to make films and in admiration of the filmmakers that I have always loved. Yeah. And so I think there's also a, a, um, some homage that I pay in my filmmaking, which I think probably informs audience interpretation as well. That's the best answer I have. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Thanks. so uh, yeah, we come to the end. So it was uh, amazing fun, guys. 
Great class. You guys have uh, really good questions, which yeah, always makes this better. It's amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you for your time. It's amazing. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, do you have a uh, last statement for this? Yeah. I mean, I think something that is worth saying right now because of what's happening in the world, which we all know. Well, I, th I think something that's really great about filmmaking, and I've thought about this a lot recently, is that, first of all, different uh, processes of it can happen anywhere, anytime. Mm. And we can shoot anywhere, anytime. My wife and I are making a short film, just the two of us in our flat right now. Wow. Uh, I, think that, I think this is one of the beautiful things about this art that we're working on. We all want to be directors on this call. And when, our, when something happens that's global like this, our art can reflect that in great ways. And it doesn't mean that you have to go out and make a film about a pandemic, but it can mean that you, uh, your art form can take on a different form of comedy because we all need something as a release these days or a direction of um, uh, related to emotional or mental states. I guess what I really mean is that there's an, uh, a moment in the world right now uh, where maybe we need art more than other times. And I think that you guys are all positioned because you've got yourselves, you've got some knowledge and passion, and I bet you've got a camera, even if it's not a great one, to make something. So I encourage you guys to even start right now. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. My okay. pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Man. Thank you, so, Neil. Uh, we hope to see Ciao, you again everyone. next time. Thank you. I hope so. See you guys. You. Good day. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe. Thank Ciao. you. Stay safe. Mantap. <laughs> Yogo, itu lu chat gua, mau kasih film apa? Lupa gua, ntar ya. <laughs> ada, ada. Nggak, lupa gua kirim, cuman udah, udah gua ini. Okay. Gua pernah liatin ke Mas Gyo juga film yang anjing gitu di Padang Pasir. Yeah. <coughs> Oke okay guys, tadi tentang directing banget sih. Jadi, sama uh, beberapa dari kalian udah lah. Kayak Ogi kan, kayak si, siapa namanya? Greg juga di film school adalah maksudnya basic basic. Cuman yang belum mungkin agak bingung pasti. Uh, gue rekomen lu latihan sih sama kalau lu ini ya punya waktu. Karena hmm, bener kata dia kita harus belajar dulu dulu baru breaking kayak gitu sih. And then um, lu kalau mau breaking terus Ya, lu harus punya alasan gitu terbaik kenapa uh, ya kalau karena kita film ya why gitu impact in, kenapa impactful buat film ini kenapa gua harus breaking the rule buat film ini gitu bukan hanya soal kece keren gitu artistik tapi harus punya reason lah dan um, gua rangkum pembicaraan dia uh, Sebenarnya dia jelasin sangat ini ya sangat uh, bagus banget maksudnya teratur sih sebenarnya dan <tuh> mulai sekarang <tuh> mungkin lu coba lihat-lihat film klasik sih harusnya kayak zamannya Hitchcock yang banyak rulesnya lah yang mereka belum breaking the rules kalau udah lihat Tarantino ya lu udah kemana-mana maksudnya kayak coba lihat film-film yang Hitchcock karena uh, Bojongho pun tuh sebenarnya Hitchcock banget tadi yang shot yang terakhir yang dia liatin yang Junet itu yang uh, orang apa ada datang terus dia dia bukan breaking the rule dia change the rule okay, dia change change the line sorry change bukan breaking the line ya kalau Kurosawa breaking the lines karena punya Uh, motivasi mau karena karakternya bimbang gitu tapi kalau yang Junet itu dia change power ngerti ya? change power nah lu bisa lihat di filmnya Tarantino 
yang Inglasius bar start pas pertama sih. Kalau change the line nggak breaking the rules mas. Tetap itu ganti motivasi. Ganti itu ganti motivasi. Gitu. Iya. Cuman. Hmm. Uh, tapi cara cara metalatino terus Bojovo juga change the rules. Pas dia si si ibunya ngobrol sama Jenny ya tapi di meja lu kalau lihat dulu gue kalau gue dulu latihannya lebih parah gue lima orang harus eh, pakai itu rules dan gue gue adab adabnya di film gue terakhir Lily of the Valley lima orang coy sing banget jadi ya ya gitulah Semoga ini kelas terakhir, jadi uh, ya gimana guys, gue ya yang masih senima lima segera dikumpulkan, yang mau mau syuting juga, yang belum senima lima, gimana kok yang belum senima lima? Ntar. Ya? Kalau mau gabung. Kabarin gue, uh, gue ada uh, silabus baru dan akan ada, gue akan datengin. Jadi uh, gue mau ngomongin ke depan sih, Sinema 5 ini bakal ada, uh, gue lebih lebih compact, tapi gue uh, gua end up-nya ke script ya, enggak ke syuting karena masih, masih pandemi. Dan gue akan mulai bulan ini. Jadi gue package cuma sebulan untuk batch 3 dan harus selesai sampai skrip draft 3 dan di sebulan itu gue datengin satu uh, satu sesi international school eh, kelas kayak tadi nggak tahu itu kafe nggak tahu itu siapa uh, nah alumni alumni belum alumni sih tapi sama satu eh batch satu batch dua boleh ikut tapi nanti uh, diskon gitu tapi yang udah ikut batch tiga free uh, untuk ikut internasional uh, kelas nanti gua akan kasih eh, gua akan kasih Kevin dulu buat desain <tuh> step-stepnya jadi yang step lama itu nggak usah dianggap dulu ya soalnya kita karena gua mau compactin gitu uh, lebih biar cepet apa lebih praktis karena kita nggak mungkin syuting kan belum belum syuting maksudnya kalau ada yang mau ikut yang baru ini buat yang baru sih kalau mau kalau nggak mau ya apa nanti feedback ya kak yang kelas kelas sama internasional tuh feedback buat feedback berapa buat feedback script kelas internasional Iya, gue akan bagi internasional. Tapi kalau feedback script, kayaknya nggak mungkin bisa fit karena uh, misalnya kelas internasional itu soalnya gue gabung semua. Ini ini aja ada berapa nih? Sorry, 16. Kelas internasional, misalnya kafe gue suruh feedback 16 script, nggak mau balik lagi dia. <laughs> hmm. Kalau mau feedback script. email cafe tanya baik-baik um, gimana sebuah gimana kalian atur sendiri lah kalian kan udah punya email ya kan gitu. maksud gue thank you loh mas kelas kelasnya berapa thank you kelas kelasnya iya lu harus ikut tapi nggak gabung selamat bergabung pokoknya intinya yang best 3 best 3 lebih compact jadi mul dimulai tanggal pertengahan lah. Apa? Tanggal sekarang tanggal berapa sih? Empat. Empat. Tanggal sepuluh lah. Tanggal sepuluh mulai terus sebulan doang dan udah script draft tiga. Oke. Okay. Nah, kalau nggak salah itu dan seminggu dua kali kelasnya. Nah, di, di jadi kan tuh delapan kali pertemuan. Jadi saat 
Jadi 8 kali ditambah satu internasional kelas. Nah, gue nanti batch sempat juga kan gitu. Setiap batch beda-beda guru. Gitu. Tapi maksud gue uh, anak-anak sinema lim- satu batch satu batch dua juga bisa ikut. <coughs> Cuman diskon gitu. Cuman orang luar juga bisa ikut. Tapi harganya beda. Gitu. Oke? Okay? Excel lima aja nih kenapa sel? Pusing dia besok mas. <laughs> oh iya gimana besok. Lagi? Ya? Baik mendengarkan sih. Lu kan sutradara lagi. Lutfi gimana Lutfi? Para sutradara nih. Gimana pak? Gimana pak? Gimana pak? Lu udah ya lu udah tahu lah ya ini kan basic kan ya. Maksudnya, ya. Ya. Ya, rules rules directing. Cuman uh, emang kalau di film memang ya film tuh emang unik sih. Memang kita harus cerita gitu loh. Hmm. Kalau di komersil kan masalah 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 klien mau mau apa enggak gitu. Itu dia, itu dia. Kenapa gue pengen ikutan soalnya kayak takutnya gue udah lupa gitu loh. Ya. Yeah. Iya ini ngasih lagi. Lu di aja. kalau di aja, lu dapat kan di KJ? Dapat mas, suara gua keluar nggak? Keluar tapi jauh. Hah? Jauh. Menurut ini, lu apa lagi? Lu udah, kayak, lu udah ngul- ini kayak ngulang ya, bang nggak? Kayak kuliah tujuh semester tapi di, jadi dua jam. <laughs> ini ngulang ya? Uh, apa namanya uh, imaginary line ini dulu gue dapet berapa SKS nih tapi di komp- terus seru latihan kayak yang lo bilang tadi emang kita dipaksa untuk disiplin dulu awalnya sama line-line ini gue juga ada 5 bulan cuy yeah. iya tapi ini begitu gue masuk ke komersil gue udah lupa ini semua <laughs> iya iya komersil kan apa yang dilihat di mata dan Tapi nah, kalau lu ada conversation kan, ya kalau dua orang sih masih gampang ya. Iya. Yeah. Misalnya... Kalau menurut gue tes yang paling gampang tuh tes, apa, uh, sin makan sih. Sin yeah. makan. Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, lu, lu, direct, lu belajar directing atau writing? Dua-duanya. Gimana di itu? Lu pas uh, udah... Ya. Eh, ini tadi kayak ngulang lagi gitu sih, Mas. Jadi... dibikin panas lagi diingetin lagi gitu. Bosan enggak? Enggak. Iya, nah, ya, nah. lagi sih. Yang yang belum tahu directing banget siapa? Coba. Saya. Saya, Mas. Saya. Saya. Kalian busi enggak? Enggak sih, tapi enggak ya. sih. Enggak sih. Cliff tahu nih Cliff, Cliff direct direct juga ya Cliff ya. Hah? Dikit-dikit. Lo pusing, go Finn, media. Gak, gak pusing sih, cuman Jelasin. baru tahu aja. Pernah baca-baca soal ka- kamera blocking itu gitu sih di YouTube atau nggak di internet, cuman nggak nggak kayak tadi gitu pikir. Ini ya. waktu gua kelas Edwin ada sih. Edwin ada. Ya? Okay. Edwin sebenarnya Pak, ini Pak Edwin, Pak Edwin Kemang. Iya. Galeri. Hmm. Emang mas, mas bukan baju Edwin ini Edwin apa? Oh Edwin saudara. Si. Oh. Oleh kot yang di Kino ya, yang di Kino. Iya iya, yang si 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 itu loh. Oh. Iya. Ah, ah, ah. Oke okay, guys, sampai sini aja. Jangan lupa besok pada nonton ya. Excel dua. Ginya Yogo sama Excel. <laughs> Eh, next-nya siapa ya? Gue lupa deh. Next siapa? Kevin sama Euro kan? Eh, sama Alvin apa? Kami jadi Kajo. sama Angginuen nggak? Kagio. Apa? Angginuen. Jadi sama Angginuen nggak? Oh, belum, belum. Belum gue kontak lagi. Mas, dia juga lagi have fun. Uh, next-nya Yogo sama Excel. Terus next-nya lagi siapa ya? Kevin sama Alvin ya? Siapa ya? Lupa, Kak. Kayaknya aku, deh. 
cuman sama siapa ya lupa oh sama Puka ya kayaknya kalau nggak salah oke gue cek lagi deh oke kak 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 ya lagi. dia mau nanya hmm. untuk uh, batch satu masih bisa asin script nggak kak nggak bisa lo <laughs> udah han batch satu udah lulus ya <laughs> batch satu udah lulus bisa lah batch satu belum Bet satu belum lulus lulus belum mahasiswa abadi <laughs> parah lo tunggu base dua bro oh, gue sih bilang boleh tapi kapan mana belum minggu ini eh minggu ini kirim aja belum udah nanya bisa apa enggak kirim dulu ya enggak oh ya enggak ini Alvin juga nih kacamata ya kak minggu ini kak <laughs> gue masih kasih kesempatan buat bet satu Uh, si ACC si Euro nih juga belum nih ngurusin duit aja nih bagi-bagi lah Euro lima ratus oke okay. uh, thank you guys yang uh, yang nggak sinema lima yang udah join semoga bisa join di sinema lima nggak tahu kalau mau uh, kalau mau langsung tanya gue atau ada marketingnya Yogo itu di bawah <laughs> Bisa tanya-tanya gue. Greg udah nanya-nanya gue langsung masuk ya Greg ya. Oh iya iya. Oke. Sampai di sini ya. Eh kelas yang batch 2 nanti gue update. Uh, mungkin hari Sab- Jumat apa Sabtu kali ya. Ya, Kak, tapi ya, gue ubah gua ubah beat set yang kemarin ya. Nah, baru bala lagi nih. Lah kan kan kemarin itu belum sempat feedback kan? Oh, iya iya. Maksudnya mau mau bikin perbaikan. Nah. Sabtu aja kan dia. Sabtu. Ya, Sabtu Kak. Jumat saya photoshoot. Sabtu jam. Ikut aja. Jumat uh, sore jam 5. Okay. abis buka puasa aja kali. Minggu lo bandel banget lagi kayak gini masih photoshoot lo di rumah di rumah buset. Oh, di rumah. Kedua <laughs> Sabtu mau jam berapa? Abis buka puasa Yo, aja okay. kali. Jam 8 Hmm. Boleh. Jam delapan ya. Ya. Oke. Eh satu apa ngumpulin skrip? Hmm. Malam ini sedikit juga. Lu mau ngumpulin lagi Gi? Atau terserah? Iya, udah udah selesai sih, tinggal gue kirim ke lo nih mas. Uh, Oke. Okay. Soalnya gue mesti ngatur feedbacknya. Excel kapan ngirim? Alvin kapan? Euro kapan? Kan diem semua. Malam ini kita kalender kak. Perlu kerjain nggak? Gua kasih deadline mau nggak? Boleh 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 boleh. Besok. Ya udah. Hari minggu hari Jumat ya. Oke. Boleh nggak? Jumat Alfi Excel uh, bed satu yang mau Kevin udah nggak perlu kan? Lu udah happy kan? Widi. Udah kak. Oke ya, tapi lu mau ngasih treatment ya? Atau lu mau diskusi apa terserah? Iya. Oke. Okay. Treatment paling enggak. Oke okay, bed satu, gua kasih deadline Jumat ngasih sesuatu nggak uh, mau krim atau apa terserah. Bed dua uh, Sabtu jam 8 kelas, oke? Okay. Uh, yang bukan sinema lima berha- gua harap gak gabung. <laughs> Selamat okay, bergabung guys. Ivan. Bye bye. Thank you kak. Thank you. Oke oke. Thank you kak Dio. Ya. Yeah.